Greetings. Fellow devotees of the Warhammer 40k universe, welcome to Alex Gordon Audios, the sanctuary of the Emperor's finest tales. By subscribing to our channel, you become a guardian of the Emperor's wisdom, preserving these stories for future generations and strengthening the bonds of our community. Together, we honor the Emperor and celebrate the intricate tapestry of the Warhammer 40k universe. In the Emperor's name, let our audiobooks be a beacon of enlightenment. Have Imperator. Esteemed Arkan, I've come in answer to your summons, intoned Hierarch Saravok, kneeling before the shadowed throne of his liege. Kneeling in this room was always uncomfortable, due to the carpet of stitched together infant canids that covered the floor, making it quite irregular. The Haemunculus the Archon had commissioned it from had ensured the beasts were without vocal cords to avoid their constant yapping, disturbing discussion, but they could still feel pain, and writhed under the sharp edges of Saravok's armour, fruitlessly trying to get away from him. The carpet was not the only example of the fleshcrafter's arts in the room. Vileheart's throne was composed of the bodies of defeated rivals, at least three of which were his kin to the Hierarch's knowledge. They were kept alive by various injectors and the constant background agony of the room's other living furniture, as well as the dozen of pain slaves hanging from the ceiling, their exposed flesh covered in weeping wounds where the Archon had struck them. I've received word from the galaxy beyond our dark realm. My servant, said the figure, sat upon the throne. His ancient voice was an unpleasant rasp, dripping with cold malevolence and limitless cruelty. Such was the voice of Shave Vileheart, who had risen to the rank of Archon over the broken and screaming bodies of his defeated rivals. Do you remember Aurelia's triumph of some time ago? The one where she took on our dear Supreme Overlord's challenge to poison the entire Moncake so-called Empire? The contempt in Vileheart's voice was thick enough to serve as armour against the claws of the Haemunculi's lesser creations. Of course, Saravok's master would never have dared to make his feelings so clear in public. But here, in the heart of his cabal's stronghold, he felt free to express his opinion of the supreme overlord and his former confident obvious. Yes, my lord. The hierarch replied obediently. The tale of it spread across the entire dark city and reached even those as lowly as I was at the time. Oh, right. That was before I took pity on you, wasn't it? The archon cackled, the sound of it making the pain slaves in the room flinch. Saravok remained impassive at the unveiled barb. Suddenly, his master's amusement vanished as quickly as it had appeared. It really annoys me. How much that bitch profited from it, you know? Even now, she keeps that little Mon K toy in her vault as a reminder to us all of her great deed. In truth, Saravok thought his master was exaggerating. It had been many years since the Lady Malice had orchestrated the destruction of a Mon Cake Forge world, claiming the panacea one of their precious technological relics, from the ashes in the process and denying the vermin its supposed ability to heal any kind of injury, sickness or poison. At the time, it had been quite the coup, but that was already old news. It had already fallen from grace. Having been exiled from his court by Vect after he'd grown bored of her Opahap, feared her potential as a rival for his position. Since then, however, she had clawed her way back to a position of powerful archons, could equal, and though Saravok knew better than to say it out loud or even think it too often, Shev Vileheart was not among them, which, come to think of it, was probably why the old monster was so obsessed. Envy was a powerful thing and served as one of the primary motive forces of Comora, along with hate, spite, cruelty, and the ever-present need to inflict suffering on others in order to placate Shea who thirsts. But here is the thing. Little Saravok, continued the Archon, clearly savouring the moment. Aurelia was so proud of her achievement, but I have learned that another copy of this Amasayas has been found. More than that, it is already being used to heal the pathetic afflictions of millions of Monkeeks. After so many cycles spent as Vileheart's right hand within the Cabal, Saravok was well versed in the ways of Dark City, and he immediately understood the implications of his master's revelation. If Lady Malice were to learn of this, uh, she would be furious, wouldn't she? But while it be amusing to watch, I have other, grander plans. If I may ask, my liege, Sir Evoke dared to say, betting on his master's good humour to avoid reprimand. How did you learn of this? 
I hadn't even heard a whisper of a rumour on that subject. The little clown came and sang for me, replied the Archon, and the Hierarch shivered despite himself. Even here, in the dark city, the servants of Sagorak had a certain reputation. By edict of the Supreme Overlord, they were to be left alone as they plied their strange craft in Comora, just as they were untouchable aboard the hated craft worlds. I see. Then it won't have escaped someone of your towering wisdom that they told this to you in order to manipulate you into attacking this world. He didn't phrase it as a question, knowing better from long and painful experience. Filihart scoffed. Obviously. But don't worry, my faithful servant. I don't intend to just go charging straight into things. Of course. May I ask how your great self intends to baffle the Moncade's feeble minds and overcome whatever scheme the Harlequins are weaving? You may not, the Archon snapped back, glaring at Saravok with suspicion. That is for me alone to know, and you will have plenty to keep you busy in the meantime. The cabal of murderous death must be prepared for another hunt. Muster our warriors and assemble our fleet. Contact the Incubi and the Wykeses of the Tainted Kiss and bargain for their services. As you will it, my lord, Saravok replied, bowing deeply in contrition. He had to fight his every instinct to expose his neck to his master, but manage it thanks to years of practice. Get out of here, ordered the archon with a wave of his left hand, the right closing in on the throat of the nearest pain slave, eliciting a pitiful whine of anticipatory pain. I need to refresh myself and then I will get to work. As Saravok departed, he caught his master muttering to himself before the screaming started. I will show them all. First that's Liberator, then the whore, and finally of that loathsome upstart. And if you hate she Vileheart and want him to die, then I have done my job. If you are wondering how the Harlequins learned of the Panacea and what game they are playing, well, you are going to have to wait quite some time. But I believe the joke will be worth it in the end. For now, be content to know that Cain is going to have new enemies to face, and of the kind that can absolutely be fought without any moral compulsion whatsoever. I thought long and hard about what to name the Dark Elder Cabal. I looked over the list of canon ones, I perused the codexes, and even checked the Dark Elves from the Old World for inspiration. Then I remembered just what kind of story this is, and once I had stopped laughing, I knew what I had to do. Behold! The Cabal of Murderous Death fear their immense cruelty and the terrible dark depths of darkness that lurk within their dark souls. Yes, this Cabal's theme is what a thirteen years old trying to be edgy thinks sounds cool. Unfortunately, I somehow don't think Kane will find the joke funny. Also real fans of the Kane series will have recognised a certain name in that last scene. I look forward to seeing if anyone catches it and what it might imply for our dear Liberator's future. The Space Hulk may seem to have been secured and repurposed quite quickly, but in Soul Drinkers, a handful of Tech Marines, if not a single one. It's been a while since I read the series manage it much more quickly. Also, Amberly has finally shown up in this story. I am sure that her final thought in her scene absolutely won't become something she will look back on with deep, deep regret in the years to come. Finding a way to get her in play was challenging, but I think I figured it out. By the way, every single Inquisitor in her scene is a canon one, because I couldn't think of any funny names and so decided to use some of the one-note Inquisitors of canon who have one mention in all the lore and then are never brought up again. And just so we are clear, Slorkenberg being a utopia as a result of Can trying to sabotage its defences while staying alive is part of the story's joke. Anyone taking what's happening in this story as a political position will be met with the most devastating eye roll I can muster. As she ran, Amberly wanted to curse, but she dared not waste what little breath she'd left. Her lungs were burning, her legs felt like lead, and her heart was pummeling in her chest. But she forced herself to ignore her growing exhaustion and just keep moving. At the same time, she had to remain focused on her surroundings. An abandoned manufacturum left to rust for just short of three centuries was the sort of place to punish missteps with crippling injuries and a list of infections as long as it was nauseating. And she had to do all that while keeping an eye out for her pursuers, who were undoubtedly far more adept at this sort of thing than she was. This operation had been supposed to be easy, thrown, damn it, 
Amberley and a handful of her operatives were going to bust an exchange between a local trader in forbidden artefacts and his off-world supplier, capture everyone involved and get the information they needed to dismantle the ring's activities in this entire region from them. It was the sort of thing she'd done dozens of times since she'd been chosen to join the Holy Orders. To her team's credit, the first part of the plan had gone like clockwork. They'd hidden around the meeting place her tech priest had extracted from the criminals' intercepted comms, and their targets had shown up with the goods right on time. Clearly those were professionals, who had been doing such heretical work for years. She had watched as the traditional exchange of veiled threats and boasts took place, and then once the packages had been exchanged and both sides had started to relax ever so slightly, Amberley had given the signal to move in, which was when the elder reavers had shown up, blasting through the building ceiling and falling upon the traffickers, the sound of their malevolent laughter mixing with the screams of the heretic scum. She and her team had been caught completely by surprise, Fortunately, the Xenios had targeted the smugglers first and hadn't expected the Inquisition's presence either, although it hadn't taken them long to realise there were witnesses to what Amberley was fairly sure was a kidnapping operation. At least the rest of her team had made it out, but that would be little consolation if she were caught. As a member of the Ordo Xenos, she knew far more about the habits of the Dark Elders than she was comfortable with enough that she was seriously considering turning her weapon on herself rather than let herself be taken alive. But things weren't that desperate yet. She told herself firmly, if she could make it out of the manufacturum, there was an entire industrial sprawl outside she could disappear in, then vox the gunship to come pick her up. The Inquisitor froze. There was a figure before her that hadn't been there a moment ago, and she had no idea when or how it had appeared. The figure was clearly an elder, but its attire couldn't have been more different from the Reavers. It was a patchwork of bright colours and patterns completely at odds with their drab surroundings, and its face was covered by a smooth white mask with an exaggerated laughing face painted on it in silver and blue. Amberley recognised the elder subspecies. The Xenos belonged to at once, though she'd counted herself fortunate enough never to have encountered its ilk before today. It was a harlequin known even among the mercurial elders for their unpredictability. One day stalwart allies of the Imperium against the forces of chaos. The next merciless killers wiping out random human villages on back way to planets down to the last woman and child. It was also holding something which was unmistakably a pistol aimed directly at her. Her own weapon hung at her belt. You. She had holstered it early in her flight, needing both hands free to navigate the manufacturum. For all her training, Amberley knew that her chance of drawing it in time to make a difference was so low as to be effectively nile. I would tell you there is no need to worry. Spoke the Izenos in passable gothic, but you wouldn't believe me. I do apologise for the inconvenience, but we must all play the parts assigned to us. You may take solace in the knowledge that you alone are required for what is to come, your associates are already safe. Before she could answer, it fired the alien weapon shooting a dart that pierced right through her bodysuit and stabbed into her shoulder. Not for the first time today, Amberley wished she'd come down in her custom suit of power armor. But then, she would have been caught long ago in the more cumbersome suit. She tried to draw her own weapon to shoot back, out of sheer bloody-minded defiance, if nothing else. But a cold numbness was spreading from where she'd been hit, and her bolt pistol slipped from her fingers and crashed onto the ground, soon followed by her own body. To her own vague surprise, as the darkness took her, Amberley's last thought was a prayer that this wasn't the end, if only so that she wouldn't have to explain to the god emperor how she'd been killed by an alien clown of all things. Eight standard months after the first anniversary of the uprising, Slorkenberg came under threat from outside forces for the second time since it had claimed its freedom. Using the new Ansible technology designed by the bringers of renewed greatness, the beacons at the system's edge immediately sent out their warning calls, teach the fruit of weeks of effort by some of the bringers' greatest minds. They had been deployed mere weeks ago by one of the few starships available to the Liberation Council, by combining the records of space traffic pre-uprising with the calculations of the scholars of the Immaterium who served the Liberation Council. The beacons had been deployed in those areas of space where ships were most likely to emerge from the war. At the time, some had argued against the apparent waste of such incredible technology. 
but Cain himself had ordered it so, and the Liberator's foresight was demonstrated once more. For all the incredible advantage that was the Ansible's instantaneous communication, and for all the promises it held of revolutionizing the way in which the isolated outposts of humanity kept in touch with one another, its bandwidth was severely limited. As such, the Beacon's machine spirits struggled to send all the details they could perceive with their Auspec suite. The new fleet numbered about a score of vessels of various sizes, and though there was a lack of hard data, it seemed obvious that they weren't of human design. This alone was enough to know that the firepower and troop numbers of this new enemy were likely several times greater than the despicable Karamazov's ill-fated attempt at punishing Slorkenberg for its defiance. Yet despite this, and how close to annihilation the planet had come when last faced with off-world invaders, the people did not panic. Instead, they calmly followed the orders of the planet-wide announcements, moving to the shelters that had been erected in every settlement and ensuring that their neighbours and those citizens too old or frail to make it on their own were escorted to safety, even if they had to carry them on their back. For as the Liberator often said, only by looking after one another could they hope to stand against their enemies. And while Slorkenberg had come to the brink of destruction the last time foreign ships had darkened its skies, now all lived under the protection of Emily's gift. The immense battle station said to have been sent to Slorkenberg by the departed spirit of Cain's lady love, who still watched over him from the afterlife, a story that continued to be told and retold in playhouses all across the planet. Then, about three hours after the Ansible's first warning, the new arrival's broadcasts reached the planet, they were unencrypted, and although understanding the foul speech of the alien was difficult, the accompanying images made the nature of the invaders obvious. Soon, all on Slorkenberg had heard the news. The orcs had arrived. Warboss Gargshash Corbel looked through the cracked, patched-together screen that was all separating the bridge of the Gork's claw from the void. The mech boys had done something to the screen so that it could make things on the other side look bigger, although nobody knew exactly what, because they'd been drunk on mushroom beer when doing it after the party during which the screen had gotten broken in the first place. Usually, it helped point the ship's daka in the proper direction, but at the moment, every boy on the bridge was too busy staring to even think of firing. That's the most beautiful thing I ever seen, boss whispered Corbel's chief mech boy from where he stood next to the warboss throne. Corbel grunted in approval. The space hulk that orbited the Humi planet they'd come to attack was impressive. There was no denying it. Uh, Corbel had seen a few of the massive things himself in his time, but none as big as that. His mouth filled with drool at the thought of all the loot that must be lying inside it waiting to be claimed. Of the Dakka his mech boys could make with it. Already, it was beautiful. Once the mech boys were done with it, it would be magnificent. Looks like there are humies on it, said one of the boys, frowning in at a flickering display. That, if Kerbal remembered right, was linked up with the claw sensor gizmos. We's gonna take it, he declared. Da humies is too stupid to use it proper. That the humies had managed to get the space hulk close to their planet without it crashing was already impressive enough. When Gargash had first heard about it, he thought his knob had taken one too many hit on the nogging. But when a bunch of his weird boys had told him it was true, his curiosity and greed had been tickled, and he'd brought the bulk of his way -a there while leaving the rest of his underbosses to tack three other Humi planets he'd marked for conquest. Looking at the view, it was clear he'd made the right choice. He muttered his thanks to Gork and Mork, before shouting, Okay, somebody put de big talky thing here on H-Y-I-O-M. I want de humies to know who's coming to crump dem e -I. There was a series of banging noises, grunts, muttered curses, and one funny scream as the cable of Gretchen was chewing on suddenly went live and incinerated the small creature, which made quite the appetizing smell. Then one of the mechs called out, It's on! Boss... Gargsh picked up the speaky thing guy, which was big and sturdy enough that he could hold it without breaking it by accident when he got excited like would happen to the last three. All right, humis ass. I is Gargash Kerbal, do boss of dis here way away. He paused, giving time for the rest of the bridge's crew to join him in shouting the holy word of Mork and Gork.
Most of them didn't understand the Humey speech he was using, but they certainly recognized that word. After a moment, he got bored, fired his shooter at the ceiling, and everyone shut up sharpish. We's here to kill you and take all your loot. He grinned, showing each and every one of his many sharp teeth to the looky thing, to make sure the Humeys were properly scared. Starting bat big ship you got. So do your best to give us a good fight. He slammed the speaky thingy down and raised his claw toward the Space Hulk while slamming his other hand on the big red button next he'd had installed next to his throne, causing the shooter it was still holding to fire and turning another Gretchen to red mist. The Gork's claw shuddered as its engines were suddenly pushed to full power, and the bridge was filled with the sound of various things and people falling down from the sudden acceleration, as well as the Warboss's booming laughter. This is going to be fun. On the bridge of the Dark Tormentor, flagship of the cabal of murderous death, Archon Vyahart leaned back in his seat and sipped his drink. The blend of crush crude eyeball and craft world Eldar tears paired delightfully with the wine made from the grapes cultivated by his gardeners inside the still living bodies of Mon Kate prisoners. He could taste the agony in every drop, and it wasn't just because the glass's sharp edges bit into his lips with every sip, adding a taste of his own vita to the mix. The Dark Tormento and the handful of vessels that made up the Kabul space assets were hanging in the Black Void, made invisible to the primitive sensors of the system's other denizens by technology that had been designed in the long-lost days of yore, when the Eldari had stalked the galaxy as conquering kings and taken their pleasure wherever, whenever, and from whoever and in whatever fashion they wanted. Shev wasn't old enough to remember those days, but he had learned much about them both from listening to tales from those who had survived the fall and later, once he had no more use for them, by devouring their memories using a delightful device built by one of his favoured Heomonculili. The process was far from perfect, but what he'd managed to absorb was enough to make him nearly weep with envy every time he recalled it. Such power, such glory, such unrestrained magnificence. One day, he swore to himself for more than the thousandth time, he would know how it felt to directly make the very galaxy scream at his whim, just like his ancestors had. But that was for later. Right now was the time to enjoy the spectacle of his latest scheme coming together. Around him, the rest of his court stood in silence as they watched the Orc fleet approach the Mon Kay planet. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen, said Villahart, with a smile that would have given a homunculus pause. Once the Greenskins have exhausted the strength of this world's defenders, and both sides are left reeling from the conflict, we shall move in and claim the choicest prizes for ourselves. Most cruel and cunning Archon, said one of the lieutenants in attendance, forgive my ignorance, but is that not the same strategy Lady Malis employed when she hunted for the panacea? You are forgiven, replied Sheev, which was perhaps the most unlikely sentence he had ever spoken in all his long years of life. You see, there is a key difference between that whore's plan and mine. And what is that? My lord, A asked the hierarch, recognizing his cue and obediently playing along. Good. She'd need Saravok cognizant and able to function later, meaning torturing him as punishment for his incompetence would have been inconvenient at this juncture. She failed to get her hands on the planet's ruler, and he answered with a sneer that he knew was only slightly more vicious than his usual expression. She had to content herself with the panacea, despite her goal of claiming both. I won't make such an error. When we return to Comra, it will be with both the Mon Cade's precious relic and their champion, so that all can see that I am better than the usurper's discarded concubine. Only the blind would fail to realize something so obvious, said Saravok in an obsequious tone. Unfortunately, there are plenty of blind fools in Comra, replied Sheev. But once this is over, not even they will be able to deny my glory. This prompted another round of sycophantic praise from his underlings, which he basked in with a relish that was mostly due to the fact he knew perfectly well they didn't mean it, but were too afraid of him to stay silent. Nobody else on the bridge needed to know that the notion of using the orcs as the blunt instrument to break the Monkey defences had been inspired by a random comment by the Harlequin emissary who had revealed the existence of another panacea to him. Besides, the bulk of the plan had still been his own work. Regardless of the spark of inspiration the servant of Segura had unwittingly provided him,
It had been at his instructions that his agents had plundered the resources of a Monke criminal group that had, on occasion, done business with the cabal of murderous death and used those resources to bribe some of the Orc war boss advisers to plant the idea that Slorkenberg was a more interesting target than wherever the original target had been. The presence of the Space Hulk on which the Panacea had been discovered had made convincing the brutes laughably easy, and the indirect route had even yielded some interesting spoils that now rested with the Dark Tormentor's hold, waiting for the post-victory celebrations. Of course, by then there would be more than enough victims to go around. Still, the Archon was looking forward to it. It wasn't every day that you got to torture a Monkey Inquisitor and rebel leader at the same time. And um no, oh, you was expecting a spiky, pointy edgit, but it was me Corbiel. Yes, Corbiel is the war boss who attacked Perlia in canon, before being heroically defeated by Kane in single combat during the events of the book Death or Glory. Karamazov's purge of the Astra Militarum's higher-ups, combined with Sheev's manipulations, led him to attack Slorkenberg instead of Perlia. You may speculate freely as to what form the butterfly effect will take, especially considering what lies hidden within a certain Inquisitoria. Mechanicus research facility beneath a certain dam on that world. I have a plan, and it is going to be glorious, and more important funny. Well, except a cane, but I reckon he's getting used to it by now. Speaking of our dear liberator, this chapter doesn't have any cane pulv. That's because initially, this chapter and the next one were going to be just one chapter. But I decided that splitting them after the Dark Elder scene made more sense narratively speaking, and also because I wanted to publish something in celebration of Varing Glorious, the latest Kane novel, be published, hence its relative shortness as well. Don't worry, you shouldn't have to wait too long before seeing what happens next. I'm going to use shorter chapters for the current arc to make the pacing tighter and more in tune with the fact it's action-focused. Please tell me what you think of this change. Also, I had to cut the orc scene before running my autocorrect, out of fear it would become sentient out of sheer hatred of me and seek revenge. As I sat on the command throne that had been prepared for me in the war room of the Liberation Palace, which might not be the most imaginative of names to give the ex-gubernatorial palace, I admit, but had the advantage of being all-inclusive and inoffensive to every member of the council, I did my best to look confident. The truth was, I was so out of my depth I could probably find where Horus Soul had ended up after his tussle with the Emperor if I dug a little deeper. My time in the Scholar Progenium had naturally included some strategy lessons. A commissar could hardly advise the officers under his purview if he didn't have a clue what they were talking about, after all. But there was a difference between knowing how to flank an enemy force or hold a defensive position and running an orbital engagement, especially since the latter was supposed the Navy's job. Unfortunately, Slorkenberg didn't have a proper navy to speak of. The handful of crafts in our little flotilla would have barely even served as a speed bump to the Orc fleet. That much was obvious even to me, so they had moved to the other side of the planet. If it came to the worse, I was confident I could find a way aboard one of them and hightail it out of the system. But given what the consequences of that would be in the long term, I would only do it in the very direst of circumstances. At least we had gotten an early warning of the Orc's arrival, even if Emily hadn't noticed me in advance this time, which I could hardly blame her for even if I dared to, considering how famously unpredictable the Grenskins could be on occasion. The lunatics around me were already praising my foresight in deploying the warning beacons regardless of their cost in resources. Truth be told, I had given the order to place the beacons at the system's edge for several reasons. The first and most important one had been that knowing that an enemy had arrived as soon as possible gave me better odds of successfully running away, even if that wasn't the most optimal course of action at the moment. But after Tessalon Kappa had finished explaining to me just what the Ansibles were capable of, the strategic implications of such a device had hit me. For thousands of years, the Imperium had been dependent on astropaths to keep itself together, given the inconceivably vast distances between star systems, shouting through the warp. Oh, I was pretty sure the actual process was much more complicated than that was the only semi-reliable way to keep in touch. But despite all the efforts of the Astra Telepathica, it was far from an exact science. Messages got lost or misinterpreted all the time, 
or arrived years after, in some cases, before they had been sent, leading to catastrophic results. Even in the best-case scenario, it could take weeks or months for an urgent message to reach its destination. But the Ansibles had no such weaknesses. According to the Borgs, two paired Ansibles for reasons that made no sense to me whatsoever. One such device could only communicate with a single other one, and it couldn't be changed later were able to exchange information instantly regardless of the distance between them. We hadn't been able to test them on any distance larger than a single star system, but the specs contained within the SDC had been clear on that point. Such technology could revolutionize communication across the Imperium and provide mankind with a strategic advantage against its many foes I could scarcely begin to imagine. By placing the Ansibles on the system's edge, it was my hope that when the next Imperial Retribution Force inevitably arrived, they would capture the devices and, in the process of studying them to learn the Rebellion's capabilities, uncover the technology for themselves. It was a long shot. Yes, but if it worked, I was pretty confident I would be able to argue to the God Emperor that the regrettable events of Slorkenberg were nothing compared to such a boon for the Imperium of Man, and as such I should be forgiven for my reluctant participation in the former, not thrown to the realms of chaos where Amelie was waiting for me. Pretty please. Such a course of action might seem to run contrary to my orders for the Borgs to hide the source of their recent technological innovations by pretending to have come up with them on their own instead of using the equivalent of a Dark Age cheat sheet. But my reasoning was that, if there was and T, Imperial Task Force in the system, the Liberation Council was already done for anyway. I knew how the Imperium operated, and now that we had defeated the first military force sent to bring the planet back into the Emperor's arms, although given Karamazov and Chenkov had been in charge, that outcome had always been unlikely. The next one would be much, much larger, when it eventually came, which, thank the throne, was most likely going to take a lot of time. Even with a dead Inquisitor to pin on us, Slorkenberg was unlikely to be a priority on anyone's to-do list. Hell, given that we'd killed Chenkov, I wouldn't be surprised if some Militarum officials secretly felt grateful to us, even if they would never admit it out loud, lest the Commissariat or the Inquisition. Come to that, take umbrage. The rest of the room was bustling with activity. Jurgen was standing next to me, having refused my offer of a seat, eyes fixed on the large hololith showing the orbital situation. General Marlone was also there along with an entourage of USA aides, as was Jafar, so that our military and civilian organizations could act smoothly if needed, while Tessilon Kappa had flown to the Space Hulk to direct the crew of Borg's station there in person, along with several hundreds, usually, troopers to help defend it from borders of Christabel. There was no sign. She had vanished soon after the Exynos fleet's arrival, citing pressing matters demanding her attention among the handmaidens. Usually that would have worried me, but I had more urgent concerns, such as the thousands of green-skinned monstrosities drawing closer to the planet I was on with every second. I had been taught about the orcs, obviously. It was part of the standard curriculum in any proper scholar. Their kind had plagued mankind for millennia, even longer than the Imperium itself had existed according to some legends that young pupils definitely shouldn't talk about within the abbot's earshot. The simple fact that they were still around was a testament to their resilience, if nothing else. But I was starting to suspect that, since I had been trained for a career of keeping soldiers from turning tail and running for their lives by any means necessary. A lot of the material had been based more in fanciful tales meant to help me bolster morale than cold, hard fact. This Gargash Corbel, if I had understood his atrocious approximation of low Gothic correctly, had been monstrously large, far beyond the preserved corpses I had been shown in my lessons. Tessalon Kappa had assured me over the Vox that the image of the hololithic projection accompanying the broadcast had been to scale, which hadn't been what I wanted to hear at the time. You can believe me. And while now that their ships were closer, they did seem ramshackle and on the verge of breaking apart, the fact that several of them had clearly been Imperial vessels until recently meant that the many, many guns every orc ship bristled with had to be functional. According to Jurgen and the captured Valhallen officers, who as natives of that ice world were the closest thing to experts on the orcs we had on hand, Corbel was unlikely to want to destroy Emily's gift. Orcs loved using space hulks to travel the void 
and given that their ships were on a straight course toward the one orbiting Slorkenberg, their intent must be to board it and take it for themselves. I would have been more than happy to let them have it, but there was the tiny issue that without it, there'd be nothing to keep them from making planet fall, and somehow I didn't think the Exynos would be so considerate as to turn back and leave once they'd gotten their prize. The war boss message had made his blood thirst clear. We weren't getting out of this without a fight. The civilians were in the shelters, while the United Slorkenberg army was in a state of maximal readiness. We were in the best condition to fight off an invading army that we were going to be. However, this time, we were unlikely to get lucky enough to have the enemy commander be as incompetent as Chenkov and Karamazov had been which, given we were facing orcs, was quite the depressing thought. If the full complement of Xenos these ships carried made it to the ground, we were fracked. The USA would give a good accounting of itself, of that I was grudgingly convinced, but sheer numbers would carry the day in the end, which meant that we really needed Emily's gift to cut down those numbers by doing as much damage to the Orc fleet as possible before they boarded it and made it useless. To avoid looking defeatist, and because any explosion powerful enough to disable the Space Hulk would rain fiery death upon the planet below, on which I was trapped. I hadn't suggested that some kind of self-destruct mechanism be installed to deny the Greenskins their prize, but I was still confident it'd take time for the Orcs to wrangle our improvised battle station under their control once they'd killed all the Borgs, support personnel and USA troopers on board. For now, all I could do was hope that the Borgs' boasts about the capabilities of Emily's gift at least somewhat corresponded to reality. Of course, the fact that my life was in the hands of a gaggle of heretics who had spent their entire lives prior to the uprising doing maintenance on deep-sea power generators wasn't exactly reassuring, but after over a standard year and a half of technically running this circus of the damned wild, the Liberation Council, I had gotten used to the constant stress and fear for my life. Rickaf, sir? asked Jurgen, proffering a cup of the beverage. Although most of the agricultural fields dedicated to luxury foodstuffs had been converted to more efficient crops since the uprising, the plantations which produced the beans used to make recaf had been maintained with a few changes to the cultivation process to remove some of the less efficient steps, which in my opinion had really only existed to make the visiting Aristos feel superior to the plebs whose work produced their drinks. I had to admit that Slorkenberg Rikaf certainly was vastly superior to the one that had been served at the Skola, and Jurgen had prepared the drink to perfection, as usual. If only he weren't a potential living gateway to the realms of chaos, he would truly be the perfect aid. Thank you, Jurgen, I said, and took a reinvigorating sip, feeling the heat spread through my body. The tension in my body diminished somewhat, along with that of the room. The sight of their trusted, infallible liberator casually drinking recaf on the cusp of a battle that would decide the fate of Slorkenberg, reassuring everyone that things were under control. Of course, had I known then just what was going to happen before this whole mess was dealt with, I would have found it far more difficult to maintain my facade of calm. As a matter of fact, I probably would have been running for the nearest spaceport to flee the planet by now. But I didn't know and so I continued to sip my hot recaf in blissful half-ignorance of the peril I and all of Slorkenberg was in. After a stretch of time that simultaneously seemed to last forever and pass in a flash, the Orc fleet reached the outer envelope of the Space Hulk's range, and the void battle began in earnest. Despite my lack of familiarity with such things, the Borgs had made the hololithic display simple enough that even I could understand it, showing the positions of the various crafts relative to one another and Emily's gift. The Orc's formation, if you could call it that, had all the elegance and complexity of a punch to the teeth and was led by the ship from which the transmission had come, a bulky thing with a cruiser's tonnage. Enemy fleet has entered maximum range, the artificial voice of Tessalon Kappa came out of the Vox speakers, far crispier and cleaner than usual thanks to the use of the Ansible for instant communication. We await your command, Lord Liberator. I suppressed a sigh. Really, they didn't need me at all, but I had to play along for the sake of morale and, more importantly, my reputation. You may fire when ready, I said. And then the entire arsenal of the Space Hulk opened fire as one and my fears regarding the Borg's work were gone, replaced by utter astonishment. 
As they stood at the metaphorical heart of Emily's gift, Dassel and Kappa experienced what they could only describe as a feeling of theological completeness. Months of hard work, done by hundreds of people with the support of thousands more, all came together in this moment, where the fruits of their labour would shape the future of Slorkenberg. If not for the safety precautions, the bringers of renewed greatness followed as religiously as they ever had the precepts of the cult of Mars. The machine god alone knew how many lives would have been lost in the process. The command center of Emily's gift was located deep within the space hulk, requiring to walk through several kilometers of twisting corridors to reach from the nearest landing bay. The bringers had established it inside what Tessalon Kappa was reasonably sure had once been the cargo bay of a pre-Imperium human vessel, although the damages of time and the warp made it difficult to be sure. The emblem of the Liberation Council had been engraved on a wall, with the emblem of the bringers represented in exacting detail within their section of the quartered circle. Dozens of tech priests and trained acolytes stood at console stations, each one monitoring a particular aspect of the patchwork architecture of the battle station. The Liberator's ban on the use of servitors had pushed the bringers to explore alternative solutions, which must surely have been part of his intent all along. Hundreds of small cyber-altered task units, more commonly referred to as CATs, ran all across the Space Hulk, performing simple tasks and carrying tools and spare parts from one location to another. The smaller automatas lacked any biological components, but their processing power was too limited for them to be classified as true abominable intelligences. There were only a few in the command center, each built by Tessalon Kappa themselves using materials scavenged from the space hulk itself. Truth be told, and Tessalon Kappa tried to always tell the truth these days. They didn't really serve any purpose, but the Magos and their subordinates found their presence reassuring. Meanwhile, at the center of it all, Tessilon Kappa served as both the commanding officer and the nerve center of the whole operation. In time, they planned to install more standard interfaces so that the Space Hulk didn't require someone as augmented as them, but that was still in the future. Everything was ready, and they could sense the approach of the Orc fleet through a hundred eyes and more. With the Liberator having given permission, there was no reason to wait any further. Established target locks, Tessalon Kappa sent over the new sphere. For the benefit of those acolytes who hadn't been fitted with Vox Receiver Augmetics, the bringers' numbers grew to match their responsibilities. Not all candidates could or wanted to be blessed with the certainty of steel. Their words were broadcast aloud by the Vox speakers at the same time. One by one, the weapons returned an affirmative, until the full arsenal of Emily's gift was ready to fire. In the name of the machine god and the liberator, open fire, insects, ancient generators roared to life, and power coursed through freshly repaired conduits, weapons that had been built using long-lost designs, and which had remained silent for thousands of years, at the very least, sang their songs of destruction once more. Not all of them activated successfully, but of the forty-two. The bringers had connected to the command center, 31 fired, filling the aspects displays with static as the void was saturated with various kinds of energy weapons. Some had been forged by human hands, using technology now lost to mankind. Others were of a more modern design, and others still had been conceived by alien minds and had required steps to repair and control that would have seen an orthodox tech priest excommunicated and stripped of all their augmetics at once. In a single moment, a third of the Exynos fleet vanished from the display, their primitive shields overloaded and their hulls vaporized. The remaining orc ships fired back at once, an uncoordinated volley that hit either the void shields protecting the vulnerable parts of Emily's gift or slammed into sections that hadn't been reclaimed yet. The sheer size of the Space Hulk made it so that it would take much, much more to threaten its structural integrity. Reports flooded into Tessalon Kappa's consciousness, giving them updates on the status of every weapon generator and the circuitry binding the two together. Normally, such a flow of data would have overwhelmed their mind, but linked as they were to several backup cogitator units, they were able to grasp it all at once. From there, it was a simple matter of computing priorities and calculating the appropriate courses of action.
something they had done for years as the linchpin of the Mechanicus's lower echelons ease efforts to keep the submarine power generators of Slorkenberg functioning against the ravages of entropy, bad leadership, and poor funding. In less than a second, Tesylon Kappa isolated which systems could be reliably fired again and sent the order to prepare to do so, while also dispatching repair crews to the half-dozen fires and other perils that had broken out in various areas. The second volley blasted another few Exenos vessels to pieces, though another four weapons were put offline as a result. The pattern repeated itself several more times, until the last orc ships were burning husks in the process of falling apart. A muted cheer rose in the command room at the realization of their victory. And to think, this was far from all that the space Hulk was capable of. By Tessilon Kappa's estimations, despite the unceasing work of the bringers of renewed greatness since the agglomerate's arrival in Slorkenberg, barely a tenth of the slumbering firepower had been reactivated and linked to the command center. Of course, they had started with the easiest jobs. Unless the Liberator decided to dramatically increase the resources affected to the project, it would take decades to fully conquer all of the many wonders of Emelie's gift. Lord Liberator, General Mahlone, they transmitted. Victory is ours. However, we are detecting life signals within some of the debris making its way to the surface. Given the recorded resilience of the Exynos, I believe it likely some of them will survive the landing, transmitting the data now. In fact, there were a lot of life signals. A veritable flock of transports and gunships had managed to escape the demise of the Orc fleet, carrying what had to be thousands of Xenos to the planet below. Unfortunately, there was nothing Tessilon Kappa could do about it. The remaining handful of weapons still functioning on Emily's gift were too high calibre to be aimed at such small targets, especially when a miss would hit Slorkenberg instead. I see. Well, nobody can deny that you and your people did an incredible job, Magos, replied Cain, and his praise filled Tessilon Kappa with pride. Unlike every superior they'd ever had in the Mechanicus, the Liberator never hesitated on congratulating people for tasks well done, which they had observed appeared to directly correlate with increased efficiency and productivity in the recipient. The performance of Emele's gift far exceeded my expectations. We'll deal with the survivors on the ground, don't worry. They'll be easy pickings for the USA. Of course, General Marlin said, his own pride at the Liberator's confidence obvious. Magos, will you continue monitoring the situation from orbit? It seems the most efficient use of my time at this juncture. They confirmed, while I doubt you will require orbital support, there are maintenance checks and evaluations to be done in the wake of this battle station's first combat operation. Then we'll see you at the victory celebration, said the general. To their own faint surprise, Tessil on Kappa found that they were looking forward to it. Few tech priests could be described as social, and Tessil on Kappa was self-aware enough to know they were not among them. But they did enjoy the company of Marlone, whose focus on all things military had enough of an overlap with their own expertise to make conversation engaging. The general wasn't on the same level as the Liberator, obviously, but then no one on Slorkenberg and probably few beyond were. You will they replied. May the true gods be with you, they added before cutting the link and getting back to work. Given that the orc leader had almost certainly been reduced to its component particles following the destruction of the enemy flagship, and based on the files Tessilon Kappa had on what passed for the psychology of that particular Xenos breed, the USA's triumph was assured. Without their leader, the Greenskins would turn on each other in order to re-establish a hierarchy of dominance and Slorkenberg's forces would wipe them out long before one had the time to emerge. It was a shame about the Gork's claw, Gargash reflected as his gunship plummeted through the Humi planet's atmosphere. He had liked that ship. But oh well, he would get a new one, bigger, killier, and with more decay. As long as you were still alive, you had to keep moving, keep searching for the next fight. That was what being an orc was all about. Bah, that was enough philosophical musings. He was alive. He had his shooter, his claw, and his armor. He even had a bunch of his nobs, all cramped together in the back of the gunship. They had requisitioned when it had become clear the Gork's claw wasn't going to make it. Oh, I flyboy. Where's we going? He bellowed over the shriek of the air running past them. Down, boss, the pilot shouted back. I know dat, genius, Gargash snarled. 
Eyes asking where down. Oh, 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 eyes taking us today, biggest humi city. Boss, that's where all the other boys are going to. Gargash considered that for a moment, before nodding. The Humi bosses must be there, along with all the best loot on the planet. Nothing like the Space Hulk, for sure, but enough to get the way Age A back up and running after their mishap in orbit. The Humis must have a way to get to the Space Hulk. Once he'd taken that, he could get back up there and finish the job properly this time. Goody A. Aim a bit outside and tell Day other flyboys to do the same. Why, boss? So that we can regroup and do a proper wawase and stop asking questions, or I'll pluck your head off and pilot this pile of bolts myself. You really couldn't get good help these days. The Space Hulk is still operational. Although the Orcs are making Planetfall, they have failed to inflict any damage upon it whatsoever. Was this part of your plan? O oh, Arch. The words of Sheev's unruly subordinate were suddenly cut off by an agonized scream as the master of the cabal of murderous death unleashed a stream of lightning from his gauntlet. The device was a vile heart heirloom, in the sense that Sheev had pulled it off the corpse of his sire after killing him with a dozen poison daggers to the back. The Archon kept the flow of energy going until the screams had stopped. By that point, the Apatimoran had been reduced to blackened charcoal within his armor, his melted muscles still twitching from the leftover current. If he was reading the rest of the room correctly, and he was, such a skill being the absolute bare minimum to survive in Comra, half of those present were suppressing the urge to attack him here and now, which, given that he had a solid circle of incubi surrounding him, ready to defend him to the last thanks to the price he'd paid for their services until this raid was over, was only sensible. The other half, including the leader of the YKs of the Tainted Kiss, who was quite the delightful little thing, he had to admit were still savouring the brief flare of agony of his victim. As a matter of fact, it is, my dear, said Chev, looking down at the smoking corpse with a big smile. I never expected the Greenskins from destroying the Space Hulk. Even if they could, we would only have risked falling into the same trap that Hoare did when she tried her own inferior version of this plan. What trap, my lord? asked Saravok. The Hierarch was utterly unfazed by the sudden murder of his liege, which only made sense given he'd seen Sheev do far, far worse. Letting the orcs get the prize instead, the Archon replied. Now, however, the Greenskins' numbers have been culled. They'll still cause some damage, but once the Monkeys have defeated them, that is when we shall strike and claim everything for myself. It was all a lie, of course. He'd expected the orcs to take down that space hulk, or at least do enough damage by rampaging inside it to disable it temporarily. The Dark Tormentor and the Cabal's other vessels may be far more advanced than the mon sensors, but one never knew what kind of technology had been fused together in the warp to create a space hulk. Perhaps the mon had figured out a way to pierce their cloaking at short range. How in the names of the Dark Muses had the mon managed to reactivate so many of the space hulk's weapon systems? He had no idea. The Harlequins had told him they'd only just gotten their grubby hands on it, and so little time had passed since then, he'd expected the primitives to still be struggling to map the damn thing. Of course he suddenly realised, and had to suppress his own rising murderous impulses, not something he usually needed to do, but those were special circumstances. These accursed jesters had lied to him. The Mon case must have had the Space Hulk in the system for years, long enough for even their primitive technomancers to jury-rig something capable of standing up to the Orcs. Given that fewer weapon systems had fired with each volley, it was clear that they hadn't done an especially good job of it either, but against the Grenskins, that had proven good enough. Why the servants of the Laughing God had done this, he had no idea, nor did he intend to waste his time and energy trying to figure it out. The motives of Sigurak's stooges were notoriously opaque, even by the intrigue-filled standards of the Dark City. However, he couldn't admit any of that to his subordinates. Beyond the sheer humiliation such an admission would represent, it would also be more immediately dangerous. To an Archon, reputation was everything. Any sign of weakness and his inferiors would seize their perceived chance and try to overthrow him so that they could replace him and enjoy the privileges of his position instead. So he would keep pretending everything was going as planned. Besides, his caution about the Space Hulk being able to detect his ships was probably unwarranted. 
Prepare the Cabalites for a rapid deployment to the planet's surface. Sheev commanded his hierarch and monitor the Monkeek's communications. We'll move on my order. As you command. My lord Arkan, replied Saravok with a bow before departing the bridge. The twilight sky visible through the windows of the chamber was lit up by the descending trails of hundreds of blazing meteors, making it seem as if the whole horizon was aflame. Yet within the halls of St. Trinia Academy for the Daughters of Gentlefolk, the war against the Orcs was the last thing on anyone's mind. Since the uprising, the Academy had changed, openly becoming the headquarters of the Handmaidens on Slorkenberg. It still functioned as a school, but now it trained new handmaidens in the ways of subterfuge and sorcery that they might serve the cause of the Liberation Council. Against an enemy like the Orcs, the help the handmaidens could provide was limited. The Zenus brutes were notably resistant to the influence of the true gods, their bestial minds utterly unable to comprehend the majesty of the Dark Prince or appreciate his gifts. This was a matter for Marlone and his soldiers. With the guidance of the Liberator to make sure the Cornates didn't do anything stupid, of course. No, the Handmaidens had their own task to perform tonight. The rite the Handmaidens had just performed was a repeat of the ceremonies the Lady had led herself, back when she had been the headmistress of the school, spreading the teachings of the Dark Prince to the young girls under her care. They had dispensed with the human sacrifice that had occasionally accompanied such occasions, though the Liberator's edict on the matter was quite clear and none of the factions of the council would dare go against him on this. However, the true reason behind such sacrifices had always been the height of sensation that accompanied the sacrifice last moment before death, which was the real offering to the Dark Prince. Now that the handmaidens didn't need to act in secrecy, even in the academy, there had been a need for discretion prior to the uprising. They could compensate by increasing the number of participants to the ritual from six to sixty-six. Here, where Lady Emily had transcended mortality and claimed Damonhood through her beloved's gift, the barrier between the Materium and the Immaterium was thinnest than anywhere else on Slorkenberg. Thank to the scar, the former headmistress Ascension had left on reality. The only other location where the veil between realms was as thin was the House of Remembrance, thank to all the times Lady Emily had possessed Christabel's body in order to commune with her beloved champion there. But precisely due to that, it couldn't be used for this, since the Liberator was far too busy with the defense of the planet. The reason for this ritual was the sudden and constant aching of the various and subtle alterations to Christabel's body, each one a mark left over from a time her mistress had infused her flesh with her essence. It had started when the orcs had arrived in the system and compelled her to seek audience with the Lady Emily. As the ritual took effect, Christabel's vision bloomed with colours that didn't exist anywhere in the galaxy, and the sight of her sisters and acolytes faded away. Her body thrummed with sensations she couldn't name, pain and pleasure and grief, and joy all at once, swiftly obscured by a growing sense of adoration as her soul drew closer to the domain of her mistress in the realm of chaos. And there she was. Even though this method only allowed Christabel a mere glimpse of Lady Emily's true magnificence, what she could perceive was enough to make her want to weep with admiration. She was beautiful, blazing with her unending love for the Liberator, her long black hair flowing like the deepest, purest night sky, her eyes gleaming with emerald fire. Yet Christabel couldn't help but notice the shadows that marred her perfect form, reflecting the worry she felt. Christabel said the Daemon Princess of Slainish in a voice that was a purr and a caress all at once. My faithful helper, heed my words and heed them well. A shadow looms in the warp, obscuring my sight. I've tried to discern its source, but it has proven frustratingly elusive. Judging by the anger Christabel could feel simmering under her mistress' words, it hadn't been the good kind of frustration. It was this shadow that prevented me from seeing the approach of the orcs in time to warn my beloved. Of course I trust in Siafar's martial prowess to see to the brutes. But I worry that something lurks within the shadow that might threaten him. You must warn him, Christabel, so that he is not so focused upon the enemy in front of him. He fails to notice the one hidden from him in time. Yes, my lady, Christabel breathed out. I will do so. I swear. The Daemon Prince's presence withdrew. For a moment, as her senses crashed down, 
Christabel felt lost and confused, her surroundings seeming unbearably drab and boring compared to what she'd just experienced. Then, with an effort of will, she reasserted herself. She should be able to contact the Liberator without too much issue. Even with the battle against the Orcs having moved to the planet's surface, she was a member of the Liberation Council and her communications would have priority. Getting to his side, however, would be more of a challenge. Debris from the orbital battle was still raining down on Slorkenberg, and all the blessings of Slyanesh wouldn't help her if a meteor slammed into her transport. Nor did she fancy the chances of her and the other handmaidens should they run into an orc warband. They were far from helpless, true, but they had their limits, and unlike the blockheads from the USA, they knew and accepted them. With that in mind, Christabel marched out of the ritual chamber, careful not to step on any of her exhausted sisters. Without wasting time changing her clothes since she wouldn't depart the academy, she went searching for a communication unit to pass on her lady's warning to the Liberator. Um, well, I told you it would be quick, but I didn't think it would be this quick. The muse was really generous with this chapter, probably because I'm listening to the Vainglorious audiobook at the same time, which by the way, is another great addition to the Kane series so far. Although I sometimes wish Sandy Mitchell used a bit more variety in Kane's inner monologue, there are only so many times you can hear him describe a tech priest as having more metal than flesh in his face, or something like it, before it starts getting repetitive. Yes, the ansibles are busted. Like, I can imagine Gilliman going, I will grant the Kanit Dominion full independence and a non-aggression pact if you share this technology with us. Without it being crack and that would be a starting offer, the Avenging Bee encounter would likely go much higher if needed. I mean, just imagine how different the Horus Heresy would have been if a pair of Ansibles had existed between Macrag and Terra. Of course, it's entirely possible that in Canon Fortique, the CSE for these devices is in a shrine on a forge world somewhere, but nobody is using it because that would be heresy for remove some of the Astra Telepathica's influence, eh? Some other suitably grimdark reason. For now, their impact in this story is fairly limited, but once things start escalating beyond a single star system, oh boy, uh, no orcs boarding the Space Hulk, sorry. I had planned for it to happen in the first draft, but Tessal on Kappa decided to be better at their job than I thought. And yes, the ritual to contact Emily involved exactly the kind of stuff you are thinking about, except more because even on Slorkenberg, Slayanesh is the god of excess, and there were only handmaidens involved, so they didn't need to hold anything back. The next chapter will have more action, and if things go according to plan, Amberley's next appearance in this story. I hope you are all looking as forward to it as I am. Oh, and I am sure the shadow blocking Emily's sight is nothing to worry about. Probably just another of Sigorich's practical jokes, that's all. Taking Christabel's call in the middle of the command room had only seemed logical at the time. She wouldn't have contacted me in the middle of an orc invasion if it wasn't important. And to her credit it was. But I couldn't help but wish I'd done so in more privacy. The state of dress of her hololithic projection as she passed on Emily's warning had been quite distracting to most of the command crew, port from the Borgs, of course, who had too much metal where their flesh used to be to be interested in such things. Even the members of the USA, who were supposed to follow the precepts of the God of War, rival to the Handmaiden's patron, hadn't been able to help themselves from sneaking glances before we'd finished our exchange. Come to think of it, I hadn't been immune to it myself, though the content of her message had soon doused any thoughts her looks might have caused. What do you think? I asked Malinu, who had been standing at my side and listening in on the whole exchange. We'll be on our guard, he assured me, and keep some units in reserve to react to any emergencies. Good man, I told him, which given he was a cornate cultist might have been something of an exaggeration. At this stage, it's really all we can do. I really wanted to leave the war room, head for the nearest shelter, and let the USA sort things out. Unfortunately, as the Liberator, that option was unavailable to me, so I discarded that thought and focused on the hololithic display of the strategic situation. Whatever else threatened us, we still needed to deal with the Orcs before they laid waste to the planet with all the enthusiasm for wanton destruction they were known for. Thanks to the various Auspex systems of Emily's gift, a few of which hadn't survived the engagement, but not enough to really matter. 
We had as clear an image of the enemy's positions as could be asked for as the survivors of the orbital battle reached the ground. Most of the orc crafts had landed around the capital with all the accuracy of a shotgun blast fired by an underhive ganger drunk on rotgut. Their occupants were converging on us at commendable speed, though given most of them were on foot we still had some time before the arrival of their vanguard. They were also lacking any of the discipline and coordination I would have expected from the USA, let alone a guard unit, with some proper commanders, of course. I hasten to add to the thought. Not all, however, had come for Canopolis. Some had scattered all across the planet, and I didn't envy Malone the job of cleaning them all out once the main bulk had been dealt with. One such cluster of dots in particular drew my attention. These ones, I said, highlighting them for the rest of the crowd. They are near the Valhallen detention camp, aren't they? Yes, Lord, confirmed one of the general's aides after a quick check, and they appear to be moving in the camp's direction as well. Why exactly the Grinskins were going up the mountains instead of moving toward the nearest villages I could only guess at. Perhaps they'd seen the camp from above during their descent, and having mistaken it for some kind of fortification, thought it to be an important target. Of course, in reality, the Valhallens were completely defenceless, apart from the digging tools we'd given them for the chores that occupied much of the troopers' time. The thought of so many guardsmen, whose only crime had been to be horribly unlucky with their commanding officer, being at the mercy of their people's ancestral enemy made my stomach curdle. I had also gone to some not inconsiderable effort to keep them alive and well, and I was damned if I was going to let a bunch of greenskin savages make it all for naught. Of course, I wasn't going to hop onto a transport and go there myself. Apart from how dangerous such a course of action would be, I couldn't be seen fleeing Canopolis just as it was about to come under attack by the bulk of the surviving orcs. Then, by the grace of the Emperor, I remembered something I had read amidst the endless pile of paperwork and reports that continuously grew on my desk earlier that week. This weapon factory here, I said, marking one of the Borg's facilities on the other side of the mountain range. It just completed its latest weapon shipment, didn't it? It did, Lord Liberator, replied one of the Borgs after a brief pause as he accessed the relevant data, but the shipment was grounded upon the arrival of the Zenus. Of course it was, I nodded. But now that the Orc fleet is down, air traffic should be safe again. Kindly inform the factory's management that I want them to send that shipment to the Valhallen camp so that the guardsmen can defend themselves. If I remembered things correctly, that shipment had initially been earmarked for the USA's reserve gear stockpiles and contained a mix of carapace armor, lasguns and power packs, along with a dozen other miscellaneous items. Not enough to completely equip a military force from scratch, but certainly better than nothing. My lord? Are you sure this is wise? asked Jafar, in the closest he had ever come to questioning my judgment since Slorkenberg had decided it would rather take its chances with the dark gods than the Geobas. Well, openly questioning it at least. As the leader of the cultists of Zench on the planet, I had no doubt he had thought me crazy plenty of times. But thankfully the sheer volume of bureaucratic work that went with running a planet seemed to have kept him too busy to plot anything in response. Weiss? Probably not, I admitted with a shrug, but it's certainly the only honourable choice, given that we can't divert any US units to defend the camp at the moment. Seeing that he wasn't entirely convinced, I continued. I gave these men my word that we would treat them right when they surrendered Jafar. That included keeping them safe from the retribution of their own masters, meaning that they are under my protection. Making them fight our enemy for us is already stretching the spirit of that oath too thin for my liking, and I will not have them do so with nothing but shovels, rocks, and harsh language. I see, he said, nodding sagaciously and no doubt already constructing an elaborate scheme in his head in an attempt to see through what he was certain my hidden. Real motives must be. Then I can only hope they will prove worthy of your generosity. Oh, I'm pretty sure they will, I replied, glancing at Jurgen. My aide was still as impassive as ever, but I thought I saw the hint of an approving smile on his lips. If there's one thing you can trust the Valhallans with, it's killing orcs. As for what would happen after the orcs were dead and the guardsmen still had all that shiny new war gear, well... That was a problem for the future. Having a bunch of Imperial troopers waging a guerrilla campaign against the Liberation Council would do some damage to my image. True, 
but I should be able to spin it as me being overly trusting and merciful, only to be taken advantage of by the Imperials. There was only so much damage the survivors of Karamazov's disastrous campaign could do to Slorkenburg, although I'd need to be careful of assassination attempts. Given my position as the rebellion's figurehead, and the presence of such a resistance would hopefully make any future imperial reclamation effort smoother, the order was transmitted at once. According to the Borg's estimates, the shipment should arrive around half an hour before the Orc warband reached the camp. The rest would be in the hands of the Valhollands themselves. In the meantime, I had problems to deal with closer at hand. Up to three thousands of those, in fact, based on the latest data, at least Malone looked to be on top of things, moving the US units mobilized to defend the capital to meet with the approaching horde. Lord Liberator, one of the Borgs, chirped in. Your own custom suit of armor is ready. I blinked in confusion. And what? The suit of power armor you authorized Magos Tessalon Kappa to construct for your personal use, the cyborg explained. Tessalon Kappa had it brought here to make the final adjustments. Well, that was nice of them, I said, meaning every word. I had no intention of getting anywhere near the shooting, of course, but the thought of an added layer of protection between my miserable hide and the orc certainly sounded appealing. I turned to look at Malone. I trust you can handle things in my absence, General? Of course, Lord Liberator, he replied, snapping a brief salute before going back to doing his job. Jafar sent me short nod as well, before returning to the task of making sure every shelter in the capital was still secure and there wasn't any issue with the hundreds of thousands of people packed inside. With that, I left the war room, following the tech priest, Jurgen at my side. Soon, we arrived at a hangar where a number of USA troopers were making final checks on their equipment before departing for the city's borders to face the orcs. And there, in the center of the room, was my armor. Tessalon Kappa had promised me a custom suit of power armor, but this was nothing of the sort. Apart from its scarlet color, it had little in common with the suits worn by the elite of the USA in recent weeks. It was huge, standing higher than a sentinel walker though it was much bulkier, reminding me of nothing so much as the images of Astartes dreadnought I had seen, if sleeker in design. A truly massive chainsword hung at its belt, and a heavy bolter was built into its left forearm, though there was still an articulated gauntlet at the end, presumably to wield the chainsword two-handed. The quartered circle of the Liberation Council had been engraved on its chestplate, which with a gesture from the tech priest gently split open to reveal a padded cockpit. This is not what I was expecting, I managed to say, more than a little taken aback. When Tessalon Kappa designed this armor, they concluded that while deploying it in numbers was impractical due to the resources required for the construction of each suit. Building one for your own use was only logical, said the tech priest, sounding inordinately smug for someone using a Vox coder. At least he was keeping to the cover story for the STI database. And why wasn't I informed of this? I asked. I was under the impression the bringers were preparing a standard suit of power armor for me, with perhaps a few more bells and whistles. Not whatever this is. We are calling it the Liberator armor, explained the Borg. It was calculated that you would reject any offer of having such a suit prepared for you, out of concern for the impact the project would have on our resources. However, after discussing the matter with the rest of the Liberation Council, Tessalon Kappa chose to proceed with it while keeping you uninformed. I believe they wanted to surprise you with this gift, Lord Liberator. Well, out of all the things I could imagine the rest of the council keeping hidden from me, this was probably the most harmless possible, though I'd rather they didn't make a habit of it. I sighed and shook my head theatrically. At this point, it would be childish of me to complain, but are you sure now is the time to test it? I don't have the slightest clue how to pilot such a wondrous machine. Better throw in some praise, just to be safe. There is no need to worry about this, replied the Borg. He briefly looked around to check. There wasn't anybody in earshot and lowering his voice before continuing. The ancients understood how to make their devices easy to use by the uninitiated far better than we do. A child could operate this armor. Except for the small issue of not being big enough to fit the cockpit, but I took the Borg's meaning. 
And given there hadn't been any reports of USA troopers struggling to master the smaller power armor, and that using the panacea was as simple as injecting it as close to the problem as possible, I supposed he had a point. You might as well try it, sir, intervened Jurgen. I sure would feel better if you had some protection stronger than carapace armor. Well, I could hardly argue with that. The Borg, whose name I never picked up, showed me how to get inside the Liberator armor throne. I hoped I could get them to change the name. Canopolis was bad enough, which was surprisingly comfortable. The armor contained some kind of feedback mechanism to help me move its arms and legs, as if they were my own, and once the suit was completely enclosed around me and the screens of the cockpit had flickered to life, it really felt as if I had suddenly grown another couple meters. I don't mind admitting to feeling a brief rush of exaltation at the sheer sensation of power the whole thing gave me before the coin suddenly dropped, alongside my stomach. Now that I was inside this thing, I could think of no reasonable excuse not to join the fight against the orcs, since the uprising and my accidental confrontation with the fleeing governor, I had developed a reputation for leading from the front, not helped by what had happened with the Jorba Cardinal and Commander Chenkov. Through luck more than good judgment, I had managed to convince the USA that keeping me from throwing myself headlong into danger was their idea. But the kind of man they thought I was wouldn't let anything or anyone dissuade him from trying out his new shiny death machine in combat, especially when the city that bore my name was under attack by foul Xeno's trespassers. It would be all right, I told myself. The one-sided victory of Emily's gift against the alien fleet was evidence that the Borgs did good work, and I couldn't think of any reason why Tessalon Kappa would want me dead and sabotage my new suit of armor. Meanwhile, the Greenskins had landed in complete disorder, with nothing heavier than a handful of transports that had somehow survived their precipitous orbital entry. I was, of course, completely wrong about that, but I had no way of knowing so at the time. Now, this is fun. Gargash bellowed as he tore another red Hume in two with his claw while firing at his friends with his big shooter, their return fire bouncing uselessly against his mega armor. Unlike most Humes he'd fought before, these red ones didn't hesitate to get into crumping distant. They were strong and tough too, although not as much as a proper orc, of course, and far from his own strength. And they had some good loot too, with some of them even wearing small mega armor the mech boys were salivating over the prospect of tearing to pieces for spare parts. Since they had crashed on the planet, the war boss had managed to rally a bunch of boys, and the rest were also moving toward the Humi city in any case. He'd even found a handful of weird boys who had made it down, which was good given how much time and teeth he'd spent recruiting them into his war band. The place was weirdly empty. In his experience, there were a lot more Humies running around scared and getting in the way of a good crumpin, although it was always funny to see them run and scream in front of the way of Jahai. But while there weren't not fighting Humies, which was a concept it had taken the wool boss some time before understanding, so absurd was the very idea of someone not capable of fighting. There were plenty of fighting ones, and the battle had started as soon as they'd reached the city. Since then, they had barely been able to advance at all. But as more and more boys arrived from the surviving transports, eventually the tide would turn in their favor. Gargash was sure of it. Until then, he just had to have fun and keep crump in the red humies. Boss, called out one of the boys. Look at this. Gargash turned to look where the smaller orc was pointing. There, tearing through a group of boys, was another red humi, except that one was big, bigger than the beakies who sometimes fought alongside the smaller humi soldiers. In fact, it was around as tall as Gargash himself. The war boss smiled, showing every one of his many pointy teeth. Finally, a proper challenge. That one's mine. Boys, S. Way H. As he charged, Gargash absent mindedly noted all of his weird boys suddenly exploding, but any annoyance he might have felt at their abrupt demise was washed away by a rush of excitement and fresh way energy suddenly coursing through his veins as the psychic energy the weirdo eyes had accumulated was unleashed. Wah! As the orc war boss charged in my direction, his war cry making the very ground tremble, I cursed inwardly, grateful that the armor hid my face from view so nobody could see the expression of panic on my face. How was that brute still alive? I had seen a ship come apart under the firepower of Emily's gift. Nothing should have been able to survive that. 
Yet here he was, unmistakable from the broadcast he'd sent announcing his arrival and intentions. Gargash Corbel himself, exactly as huge as he had looked and somehow far more threatening in person. Up until this point, things had been going as well as I could have asked for. The suit of armor was as impenetrable to the orc's firearms as I had hoped, allowing me to cut them down by the dozen with impunity. Despite the carnage I wrought, the Xenos kept coming at me for some reason, leaving the rest of the USA forces free to flank them with overwhelming firepower. Jurgen was with the unit accompanying me, not using his psychic powers, yet at my instruction. Psychers were rare, but they existed, and I felt better for the knowledge that we'd have a counter ready should we encounter one, limiting himself to the use of a las gun, which he fired with an accuracy that was as remarkable as it was vengeful. And with every engagement, I had gotten more and more used to the way the armor responded to my every command. And now this, judging by the pitiful sparks the handful of las bolts that hit Corbel's armor produced, the war boss was as threatened by my allies as I had been by his, which was yet another sign that the Emperor had a twisted sense of humor where I was concerned. In fact, the USA troopers were worse than useless in this scenario. With so many witnesses, my reputation would never survive if I just turned and ran. Although, to be perfectly honest with myself, I doubted I would either, given that Corbel was unlikely to just let me go, judging by the bloodthirsty expression twisting his already hideous face. Jurgen might have been able to help, but he'd exhausted himself dealing with the Exynos psychers and was currently being supported by a pair of troopers who were taking him to the back lines while their comrades provided covering fire, which meant I was completely on my own. Thankfully, the increased height of the armor helped keep the terror at bay. Had I been on foot, the sight of Corbel charging toward me would doubtlessly have caused me to freeze in place, leading to my quick and ignominious death. Instead, I moved on instinct, planting my feet and seizing my chainsword in a two-handed grip as I held it in a guard position. Corbel crashed into me with what felt like the strength of a bane blade, but I managed to hold my ground and parried a blow from his powered claw with my chainsword, creating a fountain of sparks that did nothing to make the war boss features more appealing. We briefly struggled against one another, green muscle and primitive, but effective servos pitted against the technology of the ancients until I managed to disengage. He struck again, and I blocked before striking back, leaving a gouge across his shoulder armor. For several panic-filled heartbeats, the two of us continued to exchange blows, damaging each other's armor but doing little real damage. To my not inconsiderable surprise, I was holding my own, the time I had spent sparring against UA troopers unexpectedly helping me deal with an opponent of around my size, but with more muscle mass. Corbel was clearly used to fighting, but who knew how long it had been since he'd fought someone his own size. Even had he encountered a space marine, they would have been tiny compared to his bulk. In the end, though, for all my superior swordsmanship and the advantages provided by the armor I wore, Corbel had far more real battle experience than I did, and he hadn't risen to the command of an orc army without acquiring a certain low bestial cunning. He struck high with his powered claw, aiming at my head, and when I moved to parry, shifted his posture to grab my right arm and twist it around. Given the nature of his melee weapon, I could easily free my whirring blade, but the maneuver had left me open for a precious few seconds. Before I could react, he raised his other arm, which was holding some kind of bolter-looking firearm with a muzzle so large I could have put my arm inside it had I not been wearing to Silon Kappa's not-so-little surprise. Time slowed down to a crawl as the weapon filled my field of view, but there was nothing I could do but reflexively close my eyes as Corbel pulled the trigger with a triumphant grin as he shot me in the face at point-blank range. This close... The noise was almost deafeningly loud. To my unspeakable astonishment and relief, however, I didn't reopen my eyes to find myself in front of a very ticked-off emperor. Instead, I was treated to the far less dignified sight of Corbel blinking dumbly, at my failing to be turned into a cloud of gore and metal scrap, before looking at his gun with furrowed eyebrows and shaking it around like a tech priest performing the rites of maintenance on a recalcitrant piece of machinery. Somehow the armor had held against the shot, though judging by the cracks on the view screen and the various icons flashing an urgent red I could tell it had been a close thing. Not wanting to waste the miracle of engineering which had saved my miserable hide, 
I took advantage of my enemy's momentary distraction, at once falling to one knee with a groan of protesting servos. I freed my chainsword and rammed it up into one of the weak spots my repeated battering had created in Corbel's armor. The energized field surrounding it sparked and shorted out, and the blade bit deep into his flesh before I ripped it out in a torrent of blood, whose stench nearly overpowered my senses as it filtered in through the cracks in my own wardia. And still, despite having been gutted, Corbel kept standing, though his sudden immobility made it clear it was an effort to do so. That was a good fight, Humi, the beast, managed to say through the blood pouring out of his mouth. It was hard to be sure. What with the blood and the fact that he was an orc, but he appeared to be smiling as if he'd truly enjoyed our duel, regardless of the outcome. Madness. Even the cornate lunatics would be angry in such a position, having been defeated in single combat after their entire fleet came apart around them. But then again, nobody had ever claimed that orcs were sane. I swung my oversized chainsword, and the warboss head tumbled free of his shoulders, aware of the watching crowd and the need to play up to my reputation. I caught the hideous thing in my left hand and held it aloft, before setting the volume of my armor's vox speakers to maximum, while also opening a general vox channel. Corbel is dead, I shouted, putting every bit of bravado I could fake into the words, a feat made easier by the adrenaline still coursing through my body. Victory is is our reach you. Forward, warriors of Slorkenberg. Forward into glory. A roar rose from the troopers around me, reminding me rather uncomfortably of the orcs' own bloodthirsty screams. The sight of their dead leaders appeared to break the greenskin's morale, and they started to flee before being promptly run down or shot in the back by the USA. I tossed Corbel's head away and considered giving chase, but my armor was too badly damaged for me to join the pursuit in any case, so it was a moot point. At this stage, it was nothing more than a big, slow target, so it was time for me to get out of it. Thankfully, the Borg had taken the time to tell me how to activate the exit mechanism before sending me off to fight the Sinos invaders with all the enthusiasm one would expect of the glorious Liberator. I had just emerged from the armor and landed on solid ground where my palms suddenly started tingling, as I felt very exposed all of a sudden. If there really was a hidden enemy using the greenskins as a distraction, I could hardly think of a better moment for them to strike than when we thought we'd already won the day. General Marlone said without preamble, opening a vox link directly to the command center using the frequency reserved for the highest ranking officers of the Liberation Council. As you've probably already heard, Corbul is dead and the orcs are retreating. Any sign of our other visitors? Nothing as of yet. Wait a moment. You bring that into focus. Is that confirmed? Get it on screen. Blood of the gods? What is that thing? A cold sense of dread slithered down my spine as I heard Mahlone's exclamation. The other shoe, it seemed, had finally dropped. The Dark Tormentor and its escorts had dropped their cloaking right on the edge of the Mon Key world's atmosphere. In the last few hours since the Void engagement had gone so decisively in the Defender's favor, the Cabal's flotilla had moved to the other side of the planet from the Space Hulk, safe from its monstrous weaponry. The Moncakes could see them now, but it didn't matter according to Archon Vileheart. Let them see the arrival of their betters and feel the terror of prey before a predator. It would, still according to Vileheart, make their ultimate victory all the sweeter, based on the communications they were monitoring. The chieftain of the orc warband Villahart had manipulated into attacking this world had just been killed in single combat by the Mon Key leader. Given what Saravok knew of the Greenskins, that actually was quite impressive if true, but that wasn't important at the moment, with the primitives convinced of their victory. Now was the perfect time to crush their hope and reveal to them the true scope of their peril. Such had been Vileheart's words when Saravok had shared the news with him. Saravog wasn't sure he agreed with his Lige's logic, but his job was to enact the Archon's will, not to question it. In fact, questioning it wasn't anybody's job, as the demonstration on the bridge had so eloquently shown all those present. Random executions were hardly uncommon among the cabals, but Vileheart's ancient gauntlet was an especially painful way for those to go. It certainly had worked in motivating everyone, as the cabal of murderous death prepared for the attack on the Monke world is Slorkenberg. The hierarch thought it was called, with renewed vigor. 
scores of Kabbalite warriors were moving inside transports, ready for a swift deployment to their target. Meanwhile, the elites of the Cabal and those special forces recruited for the raid went into their own, private vehicles. The private barge of the Arkhan was also being readied, with the Incubi making the final checks before Vila Hart himself embarked. They would, of course, find no sign of sabotage or any plot against the Archon. Saravok had made sure of it. It's the time to raid had come. They would fly across the surface of the world and strike at the very heart of the Moncake's petty civilization, already thrown into disarray by the Orc's attack. They would extract the knowledge of the Panacea's location from the leaders and take the rest as slaves. The locals had even been considerate enough to pack the non-combatants into shelters where, once their defenders were disposed of, they would be easy to harvest. Soon, the Hierarch thought, soon his opportunity would present itself, and when it did, he would seize it, along with everything he had dreamed of for so long. Engines and power would be his at long, long last. Amberley moved through the corridors of the Druckerai ship carefully, aware that the slightest misstep would result in her being dragged back to her cell if she were lucky and killed on the spot if she weren't, or perhaps it was the other way around. She wasn't sure. Her mind wasn't exactly at its sharpest at the moment, due to the several days she had spent in the custody of the Dark Elders after waking from whatever tranquilizer the Harlequin had shot her with. The oppressive aura of pure, undiluted agony that suffused this entire ship didn't help either. If she was perfectly honest with herself, she knew her escape could be attributed to her captor's stupidity rather than her own skills. Given how many prisoners the Azenos raiders took back to their hellish homeland, she had expected them to know how to build cells. But the one in which she had woken up after the Harlequin's toxin faded had clearly been designed to facilitate the torture of the captive above all else. Perhaps that was because such captives were expected to already be broken by the time they ended up there, or perhaps the Dark Elder's addiction to sadism and cruelty had warped their minds beyond all common sense. Amberly might be a member of the Ordo Senus, but she felt no desire to investigate that particular question, just as she would rather not know the details of the technology by which she had awakened without feeling any of the thirst and hunger she'd have expected after a prolonged bout of unconsciousness. Regardless of the answer, she had made her bid for freedom after an overheard conversation between the guards. She could have escaped earlier, but that would have left her stranded on a dark Eldar vessel in the middle of space. The snippets she'd been able to translate thank to her rudimentary knowledge of the Eldar language, well, not so rudimentary, but the dialect used by the dark kin of Komara hid little in common with the craft world language she'd learned, indicated that they were in the process of raiding human world. She had no idea which world it was, but this was likely her one and only chance of returning to the Imperium before her captors returned to the Dark City, at which point a quick death at her own hands would truly be her best option. The Xenos had deprived her of her equipment, but clearly they were more used to handling terrified civilians and traumatized guardsmen who had just witnessed their comrades torn to shreds by agonizing weapons, rather than inquisitors. They had missed the subdermal weaponry Amberley had arranged to have implanted in her body years before, precisely for a scenario such as this oh, most of the time. Inquisitors who were captured by those they investigated were just killed. But sometimes you got lucky and the heretic in question was stupid or arrogant enough to want to gloat to a captive audience. With those devices breaking her restraints and slitting the throat of the Dark Eldar, standing watch had been almost insultingly simple. Now, of course, she needed to find a way off this accursed ship. Well, this is unexpected. I thought I would have to arrange your escape from your cell myself. Amberly spun on her heels to find the very same Harlequin, or another one wearing the same ridiculous outfit, standing behind her. The pistol it had used to shoot her hung at its belt, and its hands were joined in front of it in a mocking clap. Her finger hovered above the activation trigger for her subdermal weapon without the advantage of surprise. It would be a long shot, but it was the only one she'd got. Then the meaning of its words hit Amberly, and the Inquisitor hesitated. The Archon of the Cabal of Murderous Death is preparing to go to the planet in person, it continued. I can help you sneak aboard his barge if you like. What game are you playing, Genos? she asked, speaking plain Gothic. 
It probably knew she could speak its tongue, but she didn't want to embarrass herself with her faulty pronunciation. And besides, she refused to give it the satisfaction of making the effort. No game. I assure you, O oh inquisitive lady, it declared, putting a hand on its heart. I do only what I must, so that all can play the parts the audience expects of them. That did fit with what Amberley knew of its breed, although what gain it could hope to achieve she had no idea. Regardless, given her situation, she didn't exactly have the luxury of choice. Very well, she said tersely. But mark my word, Zeno's, I will make you pay for capturing me in the first place. The Harlequin merely chuckled, which admittedly wasn't the reaction she'd hoped for, nor the one most people or aliens she had encountered had when she threatened them like that. I do believe that you will soon have far more pressing concerns, Lady Vale. But in the meantime, please follow me. And this early chapter has brought to you by the new Kane novel, Vang Glorious, whose audiobook I've just finished at the time of publishing. For those who missed my post on space battles, the shadow in the warp Emila is talking about is not the shadow in the warp cast by the Tyranid hive fleets. While I do plan to have Kane face off against the Great Devourer at some point in the story, it's a bit early for that. My apologies for not making it clearer in the text that it was something else. The Liberator armor is based on the Praetor armor from Doom Eternal. The old gods, except with a chainsword and storm bolter instead of an energy sword and shield. Oh, and the headpiece doesn't have horns. If someone more talented with Photoshop or just actual, genuine drawing, then I want to try to create an image of what that looks like. Please do. And yes, this means I gave Cain the armor of the Dark Lord of Hell. Why I? Because it's funny. That's why. And also, yes, we can only dream of the day we design user interfaces as friendly and convenient as the engineers of the Dark Age of Technology. Finally, once again, my characters have forced me to alter my plans going forward. In this case, it's Amberley's entire arc which has left me scratching my head wondering how things are going to end. I blame the Harlequins for that one. But don't worry, I'm sure something will come to me that seems obvious in retrospect. I hope you enjoyed reading this chapter as much as I enjoyed writing it. Don't expect the next update to be in two days, though. My nerves at the meeting of the Liberation Council that took place after the York Warboss death were even more tense than the last one, which was something of an achievement. But at least I'd had several days to get used to the idea of the Greenskins' approach, whereas these new invaders had caught us all completely by surprise when they had shown up right on our proverbial doorstep. Tessilon Kappa was attending through a hololathic projection, as was Christabel, since the two of them were still in Emily's gift and the Academy respectively. After the death of Corbel at my hands had broken the morale of the Orc attack on the capital city, I had returned to the war room, accompanied by Jurgen, who still looked paler than usual from his efforts against the Exienos psychers, but stubbornly refused to leave my side, barely accepting the services of a medic while I worked. There was some good news I saw on the planetary map. Thanks to the weapons shipment I had sent their way, the Valhallans had successfully driven back the Orc warband which had attacked their camp with minimal casualties. There were still small pockets of the greenskins scattered about, and of course there was the question of what the guardsmen were going to do now that they had guns again. But all those could wait. The armada of transports running through Slorkenberg's atmosphere on a direct course to my location could not. We don't have much time. I began without preamble. For now, the orcs are handled. I would much rather we chase them down and wipe them out completely before they have time to go to ground in the countryside, but unfortunately, we have a new enemy to deal with. I nodded to one of Machlone's aides, and she pressed a rune on the console, and the image of the hololith shifted, showing what had caused the general to urgently call me back a few moments ago. The image didn't look like a ship so much as a collection of spines and edges hammered together by some demented sculptor who probably had too much black in their wardrobe and didn't spend enough time in the sun. Several smaller void crafts hung at its side, reminding me of lesser beasts around an apex predator, waiting for its scraps while also cautious not to draw its hungry gaze upon themselves. These vessels suddenly appeared on our aspexes twelve minutes ago, began the general, taking over the briefing now that I'd gotten everyone's attention. I was quietly impressed by how calm he managed to look, although given he was a corn worshipper, maybe it was excitement at the prospect of a fresh enemy to face he was masking, not object terror like myself. 
Immediately after, they released a group of atmosphere-capable engines, which we believe to be a combination of troop transports and gunships. These are moving fast and are on a straight trajectory to the capital. It is obvious that they are of Xenos design, but the records the USA has access to don't contain anything even remotely like them. These are Dracari, said Christabel, with what I could only describe as hunger on her face. Pardon? I asked, the name meaning nothing to me. Judging by the looks on the faces of Malone and Jafar, Tessalon Kappas had too much metal in it for me to be able to read as easily, though they were surprisingly expressive for a cogboy generally speaking. They were in the same boat. A sub-faction of the Eldar race, the leader of the Handmaidens explained, commonly called the Dark Elders by the Imperium due to their many depredations, which coming from a cultist of Slaanish, really was saying something. They feed on the suffering of their victims, drawing the strength to deny the Dark Prince their own souls from the agony of others. Their entire society, if you can call it that, is based around capturing slaves to bring back to their hidden city and torture until they die, just so they can f sustain their own miserable existences a bit longer. Not that they don't enjoy it as well. I blinked as my mind processed the sheer absurdity of that statement. I wasn't stupid enough to think we lived in a fair galaxy, of course, but the existence of an entire race of Cenos who literally existed solely to torture others to survive was a bit beyond the pale even by my standards. I tightened my grip on the table to mask the trembling in my fingers. Then now more than ever, our first priority must be the safety of the civilians, I said because that was what they were expecting me to say after such a revelation. If they're responsible for the shroud that kept Lady Emily from warning us about them, then there must be witches in their ranks, buzzed Tessilon Kappa. Christabel shook her head. The Dark Elders don't have psychers. It would take too long to explain why, but they don't make use of psychic abilities at all, relying on their technology instead. I don't know what blocked the Lady from detecting them, but it wasn't that worrying as this might be. And it was. You can believe me on that. That is a question for latter. I cut in. Judging by the speed of their transports, they will be here in less than an hour. Christabel, if these Xenos are enemies of the Dark Prince, can your handmaidens call for aid from the Empyrean? They aren't anemones of Slayanesh, my lord. She corrected me with a smile. They are prey. The souls of all elders belong to Slayanesh, and they are no exception. Should we call upon the Dark Prince's help against them? I believe our calls would be answered promptly. Her smile faded. Unfortunately, I don't think we will be able to make it in time to assist you. You are right, Christabel, I said, switching my gaze to the planetary tactical map, which showed only a few scattering of red icons showing the last known positions of the remaining greenskins. Still, given the situation with the orcs, the journey north should be safe. Make your way here in force as fast you can, please. Even if you cannot arrive in time to help us, you might still be able to rescue our people should we fail. And maybe, just maybe, rescue me along with it. If these elders sought to take prisoners to torture, then there was a chance, however small, that I would still be alive by the time Christabel and her acolytes arrived. I wasn't going to bet my life on it, of course, but better to have that extra bit of insurance and never need it than the reverse. Of course, my lord, she replied with a solemn expression, although I could see a glint of worry in her eyes. No doubt she was afraid of Emily's reaction should I die on her watch. She needn't be, of course, since by that point the truth of my nature would have been revealed and the Daemon princess would be more interested in punishing me for my duplicity than her for her failure. If the handmaidens aren't available, then perhaps my people and I can be of assistance, said Jaffer. We do have our own expertise in such matters. To his credit, he didn't do anything as obvious as glance in Christabel's direction or anything like that. If he was still playing the heretical equivalent of office politics, he was at least being subtle about it. But then, he was in the city along with me, so it made sense for him to do everything he could to ensure we won the second battle against invading Xenos of the day. We aren't summoning the Neverborn to fight our battles for us, I replied swiftly, before anyone could get any ideas. That would be like jumping out of the flames and off a cliff, as far as I was concerned. I couldn't say that, though, since they might realize what I really thought about this whole a blasphemy against him on Earth thing they all had going on. Summoning them in sufficient numbers to make a difference would take too much time. 
Then we'll have to do this the old-fashioned way, said Mahloin, which much to my own reluctance I was forced to agree with. Then I noticed Tessilon Kappa not exactly fidgeting, but doing a good impression of it. Is there something else? Magos, I asked. There is, they admitted. It isn't directly relevant to the defence of the capital, but I believe it might affect the greater tactical situation. When the orcs approached, we sent our ships to the other side of the planet so that they'd be safe. This led them to presently be not too far from the Dark Elder Flotilla. Yes, and if they even try to engage, they will be annihilated, I told them. What is your point? It shouldn't have been possible for someone as heavily augmented as Tessilon Kappa to look sheepish, but somehow they managed it, or perhaps I was just imagining it. While Emily's gift provides a great deterrent against orbital engagement and shields the capital from orbital bombardment, even it cannot protect the whole planet at once, they began, clearly trying to buy time. Yes, we are all aware of that, I said. That's why we have the shelters planet-wide, so that the really important thing, our people, can be safe while we deal with the threat in the void. It's not perfect, but it's the best option we've got. It wasn't something any of us liked to think about, me least of all. But the simple fact was, a space hulk was simply too big to move around carelessly. Its sheer mass was capable of influencing the tides all on its own, and any mistake could result in the kind of catastrophe that left continents ablaze and the atmosphere choked with ash and dust. I've been recently informed that my brethren stationed aboard the ships we liberated from the Imperial oppressors have been working on some side projects during their personal time. Tessalon Kappa continued. Their posting made them especially sensible to this issue, and they sought a way to remedy it. Something cold stirred in my stomach. I had a feeling I knew where this was going. Get to the point, Magos, said Mahalone. We don't have much time before the enemy arrives. Yes, yes, apologies. What I mean to say is that there is currently a prototype, untried weapon aboard the captured Imperial troop ship renamed a Fist of the Liberator. Based on the data of its construction, I believe it could be of use in this situation. I briefly considered it. This was twice now today that the Borgs had unveiled a surprise like this on me, and while the suit of armor had ended up working out fine, while the USA might eventually have killed Corbel, that wasn't certain, and it wouldn't have come without a heavy price, given the suit itself was going to take weeks of work to repair. There was no telling whether this would work out just as well or not. On the other hand, it would be just my luck to survive the raiders on the planet only for their ships to release some kind of toxin or other parting gift that killed us all anyway. Imperial Exterminate 2s took time to deploy, which was why I was still alive despite Karamazov's final tantrum. But the elders were well known to possess techno-sorcery that worked in completely different way to the sacred machines of mankind. And after Christabel's description, I wasn't putting anything past them, although I would soon come to learn how woefully inadequate my imagination was in that regard. In the end, there were too many unknowns, so I chose to kick the can down the road for my future self to deal with, seeing that I was going to do my damn best to keep his skin intact. That was the least he owed me. Make preparations to use this new weapon on my command. I ordered Tessalon Kappa. Once we've dealt with the situation on the ground, we'll see how these ships react, and I'll decide whether to use it or not then. As you command, Lord Liberator, they replied with a slight bow. Of course, had I known then what would come from letting the Borgs play with their latest toy, I would have ordered them to dismantle the thing at once and to the warp with the risks of a Dark Elder parting shot. Or, at the very least, I would have asked for more details. But at the time, I was quite reasonably far more preoccupied with the raiders already planetside. The meeting ended soon after, and those of us trapped in the middle of the Dark Elder's target prepared as best we could for their arrival. Units that had been dispatched to the city's edge to stop the orcs from entering were recalled to the palace. But Canopolis was huge and had been built for tourism and the Jobar's ego not to facilitate military redeployments which had served us well during the uprising, but now meant that only part of the troopers made it to the palace by the time the Exynos gunships became visible on the horizon. They moved far too fast for our few anti-air defences to lock on tow. All firing would have accomplished was waste ammunition. Looking at the screen, I saw that the Enyos craft carried an array of vicious-looking weaponry, 
but to my relief their pilots hadn't decided to bathe the city in flames or whatever unholy equivalent their cannons were capable of unleashing. Then I remembered Christabel's explanation and realized the reason for that was probably so they could enjoy the agony of as many of us as possible in person, and my relief withered and died. They finally opened fire once they were near the palace tearing huge holes through the outer walls through which the transports could pass in order to disgorge their cargo of murderers and slavers. The picked recorders in the landing areas went dead, either destroyed or shut down by the Xenos' techno sorcery, and leaving us with a map of the palace showing their entry points. Well then, I said, twirling my chainsword in a theatrical gesture and doing my best to look unconcerned. Let us be about it. Our strategy, such as it was, was rather simple. The troops already in the palace would do their best to harass and hold back the Aegeinos from reaching the shelter entrances in the lower levels, hopefully using their knowledge of the terrain to gain the advantage, until the flow of reinforcements from the rest of the city overwhelmed the raiders and forced them to retreat, or the handmaidens arrived and we could escalate through the use of sorcery. And while the clerks and adepts would remain in the war room, I had instead chosen to join one of the teams roaming the labyrinthine corridors of the palace for the enemy with Jurgen insisting that he was fit to join me, although he still looked distinctly paler than usual. Counterintuitive as it sounded, my paranoia was telling me that staying in one place was a bad idea. These raiders had apparently spent thousands of years preying on human worlds. I had to assume they knew how to identify a priority target, by now meaning that the war room wasn't so much a safe zone as it was a big, juicy, immobile target. At least by going on the offensive, I could exert a measure of control over my own fate instead of just sitting in place and waiting for the inevitable assault. The troopers were determined to give their lives to save mine if need me so my efforts to hide behind them would be less noticeable and it wouldn't hurt my heroic reputation and there would be a lot less witnesses if I needed to make a run for it. And if you think that sounds like a daft idea, well, looking back you would probably be right. But exhaustion was beginning to take its toll on my mental state, no matter how well I hid it from my supposed subordinates or how much excellent recaf Jurgen provided me. I'd been awake for twenty hours by that point, and my sleep the previous night hadn't exactly been peaceful, haunted by images of green-skinned, red-eyed monstrosities. That the USA troopers were still fighting fit was a testament to the unexpected effectiveness of the brutal training. I'd designed for them with the intent of breaking their spirit. In hindsight, my state of fatigue might also explain some of what happened later that day. As Amberly crept through the corridors of a grand palace, she could hear the sounds of battle in the distance. The cruel laughter of the dark elders was mixed with the sound of las weapons and defiant battle cries that were clearly of human origin, both echoing through the corridors of the unfamiliar building. She'd only the vaguest idea of where she was going, that a cursed elder clown had vanished moments after they'd left the transport, leaving her alone on an unknown world at war. With the druckery having rushed out to hunt, leaving the barge had been relatively easy well, as easy as sneaking around a bunch of murderous senos hell-bent on pillage and torture could ever be, judging by the opulence of her surroundings, it was clear she was in some imperial built center of governance, although there was an unusual lack of aquilae and other emblems of imperial authority. She was clad in simple clothes, which the harlequin who had brought her to the transport had provided to replace the rags in which the dark elders had dressed her unconscious form. It was the kind of habit that would go unremarked on thousands of worlds. Combined with her training, she would be able to melt into any crowd, so long as she could find one which, given the messages warning all civilians to seek shelter that were still being broadcast on public announcement screens, was going to be difficult. The Inquisitor was making her way through a room filled with desks covered with abandoned paperwork and clerk, working stations when she heard a noise. She leapt underneath the closest desk, but she hadn't been quick enough. The squad of dark elders who had just entered the room had seen her, and they promptly converged on her position, chuckling malevolently as they did so. One of them kicked over the desk she'd been hiding under, sending sheets of paper flying, and she scrambled to her feet and away from them, but there was nowhere to run. Hold on, said another of the dark-clad monsters. His words were translated by the device he wore around his throat. When raiding, the Drakari wanted to be sure their prey could understand their taunts and vivid descriptions of their inevitable doom, 
but they didn't want to sully their tongues by speaking the language of their perceived inferiors. Isn't that Vileheart's recent acquisition? How did it get out? Does it matter? Reposted another. Let's drag it back to the barge. The Archon will be pleased with us, eh? But not with it, he added with a sneer. The one who'd spoken first advanced toward Amberley, raising a blade dripping with venom that burned holes in the carpet. She steeled herself. She could get out of this. It would be dangerous, but there was the familiar sound of a bolter firing, and the Xenos leering face vanished from its shoulders before she'd time to blink. Its companions were turning toward the other side of the room, where a score of soldiers in crimson were advancing. The firefight that followed was short, but brutal. The Exenos rifles fired monomolecular projectiles coated in poison that pierced right through the trooper's armor, which, she noted, was of a far better quality than was typical of most planetary defense forces, sending a handful convulsing to the ground, but the rest kept coming on regardless, and soon the Drakari had been reduced to twitching piles of steaming gore. The soldiers double-tapped them with gratifying thoroughness, then immediately attended to their wounded comrades. To Amberley's amazement, whatever was in the injectors they were using appeared to do the trick. Knowing what kind of venoms the Dark Elders tended to use, she'd already written off the wounded as lost, but within moments they were tentatively rising to their feet. Except for one, whose skull had been perforated cleanly and who remained on the ground, clearly beyond anybody's help but the Emperor himself. The leader of her unexpected saviours approached her, and she prepared to flash her inquisitorial elect too, which was embedded in the palm of her hand. Given her state of dress, it would probably take some time for the locals to realise that, yes, she really was an inquisitor. But fortunately, this wasn't the first time she needed to pull off something like that. Are you all right, miss? he asked in a soothing tone, no doubt taking her for a traumatised civilian. Amberley got a closer look at him and froze in recognition all thoughts of activating her electu vanishing like snow in a tallen desert. Somehow, she could hear that accursed Harlequin laughing at his own jest. For there, clad in ornate crimson carapace armour, and holding a gilded bolt pistol in one hand and a chainsword in the other, looking like he'd just stepped out of a painting of a heroic warrior, was Syaphas Kane, the renegade commissar who had spearheaded a rebellion against the Imperium and th killed one of her fellow inquisitors in single combat. Well, at least that answered the question of which planet she had ended up on, if nothing else. The young lady looked frozen in place, which was only to be expected given the situation she'd just been into, and, though it had saved her life, the sight of her attackers being put down probably hadn't helped either. I didn't know how she hadn't gotten to the shelters in time, but with millions of people in the capital, I supposed it was inevitable some would slip through the cracks no matter how efficient the planetary bureaucracy had become since its forceful restructuring. Slowly, she unfurled from her crouching position against the wall, her height nearly matching mine, which was rare even among people who, unlike the majority of Slorkenberg's population, hadn't grown up with some degree of malnutrition or another. She was beautiful, with shoulder-length blonde hair and eyes of a most arresting blue set in a face that, even with the stress of the current situation, managed to still be lovely. It's all right. I told her as gently as I could while still holding my weapons. You're safe now. Can you tell me your name? I, I am Amberley, Lord Kane, she managed to say. Amberley Vale. Miss Vale, you really shouldn't be out here right now, I said as gently as I could while my blood was still pumping from the engagement, however brief it been. The ease with which the Zeno's weapons had punched through the trooper's armor hadn't exactly been reassuring, and I was all too aware but, but for random chance, I would have said the grace of the Emperor, but I doubted he was willing to intervene in my favour at the moment. It very well could have been me laying dead on the ground. Why didn't you go to the shelters? Are there other people out there in need of help? She shook her head. No, just me. I wanted to check on someone, and I missed the shelters closing, and then, and then... She wrenched out a sob, trembling with mixed terror and relief, and I gently patted her shoulder after holstering my chainsword. There, there, I told her. You are safe now, I give you my word. Which wasn't worth much, but nobody here knew that except me.
She didn't seem entirely reassured, which given that there were still more Exenos around showed fear hadn't completely addled her, but she did nod shyly, without making it obvious. I escorted her to the middle of our formation as we continued our sweep of the palace. That way, I could make it look like I was staying close to her out of concern for the civilian lost in a war zone, while conveniently letting the troopers take point without making it obvious or damaging my reputation for leading from the front. We'd been lucky so far. Apart from the group of warriors who'd cornered Miss Vale, we hadn't encountered any of the raiders. Judging by what I was hearing in my vox bead, the rest of the defenders weren't nearly so fortunate with reports of all manners of horrors being unleashed, from deformed mutants possessed of hideous strength to packs of beasts that were only partially material, and in one particularly vicious skirmish, what the sergeant in charge swore was a mobile torture engine. We were making our way out of the administrative chamber when the sounds of battle suddenly rose from another room further ahead. Before I could say anything, the troopers were charging toward the noise, and I was left with the choice of joining them or staying behind and being left all alone. Reluctantly, I picked the least bad option and followed, making it look like my hesitation had been for Miss Vale's sake. To my slight surprise, she kept up with us easily, fear no doubt granting her vigour far beyond what her day-to-day -day life required of her. The sight that greeted us was as grim as I had expected, but that was just about the only thing about it that didn't surprise me. Seravok breathed deeply, revelling in the high of battle as he stabbed his blade down into the heart of a downed incubus of the Shrine of Sharpened Spite, finishing the warrior off. The battle had been short and brutal, the incubi reacting to the betrayal with commendable alacrity, defending their employers against treachery was, after all, quite literally written in their job description but ultimately proving no match for the Hierarch's careful preparations. While betrayal was a way of life in Comora, to strike during a real space raid was anathema to the principles of the Dark City, for the Drakari depended on a constant flow of new victims, and without it their entire civilization would collapse. But if there was one lesson Saravok had learned in all his years serving Vilehard, it was that only the weak clung to principles, the strong took what they desired and did as they wished, and if they couldn't deal with the consequences of doing so, then they had never been strong in the first place. Looking around, the hierarch saw that he was surrounded by the dead, with only two other souls in the room yet eluding the embrace of Shay Hu Thirst. Incubi and Hecateri laid on the ground amidst pools of elder blood, its thick and rich scent almost intoxicating all on its own. The Hecatari's assistance had been easy to buy, given that Vilehart had relied on him to hire the white cult of the Tainted Kiss in the first place. It certainly hadn't been cheap, however. In addition to several favours to be discussed at a later date and quantities of resources and slaves, the succubus who had been chosen to lead the circles assigned to the raid had also bartered for the lives of two of Vilehart's top prizes, Inquisitor his agents had captured by random chance while setting up the raid's preparations, and the Monkey leader of this world. How she had even known of the former's existence, Saravok had no idea. It was a weakness in the Cabal's security he'd have to close once he ascended as its new Archon. Letting go of such valuable prizes was painful, but well worth it in Saravok's opinion, as his chances of turning the Cabal's own warriors to his cause had always been shaky at best. If there was one thing Vileheart excelled at besides murdering those who possessed what he wanted for himself, it was instilling fear into the hearts of his subordinates. And besides, there had always been the chance the succubus wouldn't survive to claim her reward, even if he wasn't stupid enough to sabotage his own usurpation attempt by scheming against her any more than was expected not plotting anything at all even if only as a precaution, would rightly be seen as a mortal insult. Given that Militia was crumpled and bleeding against a wall, her chest rising and falling unsteadily, he might not even need to use any of these plots after all. If she did live, Saravok still intended to pay the promised reward. He would need allies to cement his control over the cabal of murderous death after all, but he wasn't going to help her. If she died from her injuries, well, then she was too weak to be of any use to him anyway. For now, though, it was time for Saravok to claim the one prize he'd been pursuing for centuries. With a wide smile on his lips, he approached the downed form of she Vileheart, who glared at him. 
Saravok, you despicable piece of effluent, snarled Vileheart, still managing to talk despite the hole in his chest and sounding as prideful as ever. That would soon change. Saravok promised himself. What do you think you're doing? Replacing you as leader of the Cabal, of course, replied the Hierarch Swantabiakon, savouring the look of hatred in his former master's eyes. Is that not our way? Do you think you've won? Shev spat, every word accompanied by a mouthful of blood. Even if you strike me down, I will return. And my vengeance? No, said Saravok, reveling in Vileheart's look of outrage at being interrupted. After so many years of playing the obedient servant, the feeling was exhilarating. You won't. I know all about the safeguards you set to avoid the more of she who thirsts, Sheev, and I found an appropriate counter. He brandished the weapon he'd kept hidden for months, moving it from his private quarters aboard the Dark Tormentor to the barge just before the raid, and Sheev's eyes widened in recognition. In Comora, where the mighty could cheat death thanks to the Haemonculi's services, the quest for ways to make sure your enemies stayed dead when you killed them was never-ending. The arm race between killers and necromancers had gone on for thousands of years, and both sides had produced some truly fascinating wonders and horrors during that time. What Saravok held was one such wonder, an anima devourer forged by the now extinct coven of extinguished hope to the naked eye. The anima devourer didn't look like much, though there was an undeniable artistry to the way its myriad blades clicked and whirred together around Saravok's fist, but he could feel the weapon's raw malice, its hunger for the soul of its wielder. Anyone killed by the anima devourer would have their essence wrenched from their flesh, and instead of being cast into the sea of souls where it would become the playthings of the adversary until the Haemon Culi could pull it back into a new body, it would be utterly consumed by the warp-born entity. Shackled at the device's core using technology that had long been lost to all of the Aldari Empire's fragmented remnants, such had been the terror the Coven of Extinguished Hope had inspired when its ability to create the Anima Devourers had been revealed they had been utterly wiped out by a coalition of various cobbles, shrines, cults, and rival covens. The mere possession of one of the devices was enough to earn death in the eyes of the other cabals, out of fear it would be used against them, which, of course, meant most major cabals had one hidden away in their most secret vault, while Vect flaunted his collection openly, secure in the knowledge nobody could do anything against him. But even the Supreme Overlord was cautious of actually using the accursed things. Obtaining one had taken Saravok decades, and more blood and pain than he cared to admit. But it had all been worth it for this moment, when he could see the fear dawning in Vileheart's eyes. You would go that far, croaked the Archon. Of course I would, Saravok sneered. I know, Sheev. I know it was you who orchestrated the downfall of my family while I was only a child leaving me in the streets. I know you only took me within the carbal of murderous death because it amused you to have the scion of your old enemies as your servant. I have known for centuries, but I kept my peace, climbing through the ranks until I stood at your right hand, waiting for the right moment to strike. And now, now it ends. As he moved to strike, all of Saravok's attention was focused on the down Darkhorn. Despite everything, Saravok refused to underestimate Vileheart and was wary of any last trick the Archon might possess. He also wanted to savour the kill and fix it in his memory for all eternity. So focused was he that he only heard the noise of new arrivals when it was too late. At the last moment before his blow landed, Saravok turned aside just in time to see a score of Mon Ki in crimson armour bursting into the room. Before Saravok could do anything, they pointed their weapons straight at him and opened fire. The strength of their focused fire drove him back, away from Vileheart. No. No, it couldn't end like this. He wouldn't accept it. He hadn't even claimed his vengeance yet. He was going to be the Archon of the Cabal of murderous death. He was... The armor around his neck cracked and broke. There was pain, hot and crude, and then, briefly, darkness. All sensation fled, leaving only the memory of existence. And for the shortest of eternities, the horrifying thought that this endless silence might be all that awaited. Then, a voice. Hello, little Saravok. Oh, oh no. No, 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 no. Oh, yes. 
When Militia had chosen to take Saravok's offer of helping him kill his cabal's Archon despite the obvious risks it entailed, she had done so only after careful consideration. At the time, it had seemed a well-calculated gambit, with the potential to not only propel her to rulership of the Tainted Kiss, but also to secure the Coven's advancement along with her own. And while the Tainted Kiss's association with the Cabal of Murderous Death had benefited the Coven, there was no denying the simple fact that Vileheart was a very easy creature to hate. It had been a mistake. Not just going along with Saravok's ploy, but joining this raid in the first place. Everything had gone wrong, despite Vileheart's attempts to claim it was all part of his plan. And now here she was, lying bleeding on the floor of some Mon K hovel, having just watched her employer blasted apart right before her eyes. Well, at least the Mon Cakes hadn't noticed she was still alive. Vileheart had proven himself useful for once, drawing their attention by loudly laughing at the sight of his would-be usurper's demise. Every gun was aimed at him, not that he looked afraid of them in the least. I have some questions for you, Sinos, and I advise you to talk and not waste either of our times, said the one who seemed to be their leader, based on how the rest moved around him and how different he'd still primitive the pistol he held looked. What happened here? Vileheart stopped laughing and sneered. I recognize you, he said. You are the leader of this world's vermin, aren't you? Indeed. I am Siafas Kane, the Liberator, and I have the honor of leading the Liberation Council. Now, since I have introduced myself, don't you think you should return the favor? Not that I expect much in the ways of manners from uninvited guests, of course. Foolish Moncake, the Archon spat, you have doomed yourselves and you don't even know it. But I suppose I should tell you just so that you can despair at your own folly. I am Sheev Vileheart, Archon of the Cable of Murderous Death, and it is by my will that your pitiful world was attacked by the Greenskins. From where I am standing, your plan doesn't seem to be working that well, Kane pointed out, unless it somehow involved you bleeding to death surrounded by your dead allies, in which case I think even the Sientians would laugh at you. That vermin, he pointed at Saravok's corpse with his chin, attempted to kill me and claim my power as his own, but you stopped him. An easily corrected oversight, retorted the Mon Kay, lifting his weapons threateningly. Or do you think you can do anything but die in your state? Dear, I am beyond death. Worm AI, you may kill this flesh, but I will live again, ranted Vileheart, and when I do, I will return to this miserable world and wipe it clean of your miserable kind. Will you now, said Kane, his voice suddenly much lower. Around him, Melissa saw that the trooper's grip on their weapons was tightening, even after it ended so well the first time. Yes, declared Villahart, more blood pouring from his mouth as his agitation aggravated his injuries. I will return with far more forces, and this time we will not stop until nothing is left of this world, but a poisoned wasteland over which the screams of the dying shall echo forevermore. I will make slaves of your people and boots of your children's skin. And you, Cain, you I will make what? As I throw your brutes into the arenas of the Dark City to be cut apart for the entertainment of their betters, you will see each and every one of your companions die, and then and only then will I give you the mercy of death? No, you won't, said Cain, his voice cold as the grave. He took a deep breath and softly spoke one word. Emilia. Militia's pained breath caught in her throat. That simple name was sending shivers down her spine, and the shadows in the room suddenly seemed to have grown longer. While the temperature had plummeted, the blood pooling on the ground frosted, and a spiking headache added to her list of agonies. Even the Monkai soldiers looked around uneasily, and the one unarmed female who was with them for some reason stared at Cain with wide eyes. I call upon you, beloved, he continued, face taut with an emotion Melissa couldn't identify as he slowly walked toward the Archon. In the name of the Dark Prince and the bond we share, I offer you this wretch, and asks that you ensure his shade never returns to haunt the living. What are you doing? asked Vileheart, and for the first time since the Hierarch's death there was fear in his voice. Ensuring you don't escape your rightful punishment, replied the Mon Kay warlord, and rammed his chainsword through the hole in the Archon's chest before triggering the blade. Vileheart screamed, briefly, then fell silent, his body continuing to twitch for a few more seconds before going still. The unnatural pressure didn't abide with his demise. 
If anything, it grew worse. The Mon Kay soldiers looked around warily while clutching their weapons. One of them glanced in her direction, and she froze as his rifle immediately snapped up toward her, and he called out, There is one still alive over there. Then finish them off, replied the leader dismissively. We still have... Wait. Before the horrified eyes of every soul in the room, the gutted corpse of Sheev, Vileheart rose to its feet. Its flesh was running like molten wax, and within a few of Militia's pained heartbeats nothing remained of the Archon's features. The ruined armor he'd worn into battle fell away like a discarded shell, revealing a humanoid figure of flowing purple biological matter, in whose skull a pair of blazing green eyes opened. After a brief moment of shock, the Mon Kay troopers made to aim their weapons at the horror, but Cain dissuaded them with a single gesture, his sharp gaze fixed on the monstrosity. Hold, Emily, is that you? Ah, beloved, said the voice coming out of the Archon's corpse. I should have known you would recognize me. Well, it is still disturbing to see you like this, I must admit. I'm afraid that I much prefer your usual look. It laughed, a melodious sound that was entirely at odds with the vessel it was puppeteering. Dear sweet Siafas, always so honest. There was no need for such solemnity between us, you know. It felt more appropriate, he replied, sounding nervous like a cabalite unsure whether the wike he fancied really enjoyed his courting gift or was just toying with him before eviscerating him. Asking you for a favor like this, oh beloved, it crooned. That was no favor at all. I promise you that fool will never come back to threaten our people. But now, its burning gaze suddenly turned to militia, pinning her in place under its infernal weight. Let's talk about you, whom. Militia didn't quail under that gaze, but her reaction wasn't far from it. Militia Mortalis, Emili purred, and the succubus twitched as she heard the entity speak her name. Third succubus of the tainted kiss wike cult. Do be afraid, the daemon princess continued, her enjoyment of Militia's terror obvious. Your former employer has made me very, very angry by going after what is mine. But rejoice, he is the one who will suffer my displeasure so I won't drag what passes for your soul out of your body and take it back with me to the realms of chaos to add it to my growing collection of fools who for dared threaten my beloved Syaphas. You? You won't? asked Monsieur. Recent events have shown that I cannot protect my beloved as much as he deserves from the realms of chaos, and my handmaidens have other duties they must perform for him. You will serve him as his blood would. You will protect him with your life knowing that if anything happens to him, the worst torments of your dark city will pale compared to what I shall inflict upon you. Admittedly, an incubus would be more used to such a task, but you proved yourself stronger than them, if nothing else. The being gestured at the corpses strewn across the room, where her sisters had fought alongside Seyravok to defeat Vileheart's guards, and in return for your loyal and faithful devotion, you will be spared from the thirst. You can't do that said the succubus before she could stop herself. It was one of the very pillars of Drakari existence, an unchangeable fact that, no matter how much they pretended otherwise, was the very foundation of their entire society. I am one of Slayanesh's favoured, replied Emily, her voice smooth as polished bone. I can do whatever I want in the name of my love. Love? Love? Briefly... Malicious gaze turned away from the daemon host to stare at the monkey leader in shock. What manner of depravity was this man capable of to make a creature of she who thirsts refer to him with such affection? What unspeakable horrors had he performed to earn the favor of such a being? And why, in the name of all the dark muses, had Vileheart thought it was a good idea to raid the planet he was on? No, even that bastard would have balked at such a prospect, even for a chance to show up Aurelia Malis. He couldn't have known about this, meaning he was incompetent, not suicidally arrogant. Not that it made much of a difference in the end. Emilie was still looking at her, waiting. There was no choice, not if she wanted to avoid sharing Vileheart's fate. And while the Archon might still be able to return to Camorra, as this was hardly the first time the Haemonculi had to resurrect a noble loss to creatures of she who thirsts, the succubus had no such arrangement in place. Swallowing her pride, Militia bowed her head. I will do as you command, she said. Of course you will.
said the creature, before laying its right hand at the base of her throat, moving too fast for Melissa to have time to react. This will hurt. The contact burned Melissa's skin, but it was nothing compared to the flare of agony that followed, engulfing her entire being and blacking out her vision for a moment. Despite having endured terrible injuries in the arena without every crying out, she screamed then. When the daemon host pulled its hand back and her consciousness returned, a purple mark was left branded on her pale skin. It was a symbol she recognized with horror. The chaos mark of Slayanesh, the doom of the Adari and devourer of souls. Such was her fear at the sight. It took a moment for Militia to realize that the thirst was gone. For the first time in her centuries of life, she felt satiated, without the edge of anticipated starvation that always remained, even after the most intense feeding session. The relief was so intense that it took her a moment to notice that her injuries were gone as well, her skin smooth and unmarked where it had been torn and bleeding moments before. She looked up at the being that had saved her life and damned her forever in the eyes of her kin and saw that the possessed body of Sheev Villahart was falling apart, cracks spreading across it as it failed to contain the power of the entity puppeteering it. It seems I am out of time, mused the creature, turning its burning gaze back to the Mon Key leader. Take care, beloved. I still know not what the shadow that hid these wretches from my sight was. I will. Kane replied, showing absolutely no fear in the face of a being which could end him with a thought. Thank you, Emily. With one final giggle, the daemon host fell apart, ash spreading on the ground. Militia heard the relieved breaths of the soldiers as the psychic pressure vanished. Well, said their leader, turning his gaze on her after looking at the ashes for a few moments, an unreadable expression on his face. I cannot say I saw that coming. I suppose I'll be relying on you then. Slowly, aware of the fact she was being watched by a score of very nervous troopers, Militia stood up. Pushing down every instinct alongside the rage and humiliation, she felt at the motion. She bowed deeply before her new employer. I cannot say I expected this either. She said truthfully enough, but I shall do my best to prove worthy of this. Honor bestowed upon me. The slight twitch of Kane's lips told her that he knew exactly what she really thought of that honours and was enjoying her discomfort and humiliation immensely, as expected from someone who'd earned such favour from the hungering goddess. For now, Militia would play along because she simply had no choice. But she would keep an eye out for any way out of her predicament, and on the day she found one, Kane would pay for this outrage. She'd keep him alive, if only so that she could kill him herself if no when she broke free. She swore this to herself, trying to ignore the voice at the back of her mind, mockingly saying she was only trying to make herself feel better. The Envenom Dagger was a small frigate, its hull marked with the emblem of the Cabal of murderous death. Like the rest of the Cabal's fleet, it hung in the void above the Mon K world, having disgorged its cargo of warriors to the planet below. Unlike most of the fleet, however, no one was returning to it from the surface the frigate's two pilots were completely alone aboard the spaceship, having been chosen to stay behind as part of the endless dance of threats and favours that kept the society of the Dark Elders turning. There weren't even any slaves they could amuse themselves with. At the Arkans' insistence, the holds of the entire fleet had been emptied before their departure, so that there would be more space for fresh captives. It had made the journey here difficult, as the grip of Shay who thirsts grew stronger and stronger the longer they remained in the Materium. But Vileheart had a way of teaching his subordinates not to defy his orders, however stupid they thought them to be. What was happening on the planet wasn't clear, but it was obvious something had gone very wrong. Judging by the panicked messages from the retreating raiders, the Moncades had used some kind of sorcery to call forth a powerful servant of She Who Thirsts, which had devoured Vileheart's soul, or Sarevoks, or those of his entire Incubi retinue. Or there had been an attempted coup by the Hierarch, or a purge of the Cabal by the Archon. The point was, something happened, and now what was left of the entire raiding force was running back to the ships. In a way, they were fortunate to be left with only each other, since the round of promotion seeking murders had already started on the Dark Tormentor. The Cabalites who had made the trip aboard the Envenomed Dagger were either dead or had decided to go aboard the Dark Tormentor to try their hand at murdering their way up what remained of the Cabal's hierarchy. 
One of the local ships is moving toward our position, said one of the two pilots, and the Monke on the planet are trying to talk to us. We might as well listen, suggested the other with a sneer of disgust at the thought. It might explain just what in the depths just happened. A moment later, a Monke voice echoed from the speakers, proud and confident. Not a tone of voice the Drukhari were used to hear coming from Monke. This is Cyphus Kane, leader of Slorkenberg's Liberation Council, addressing the Drukhari vessels in orbit. Your leader is dead. I sent his soul to the realm of Slayanish myself. The rest of your troops are either dead or fleeing. Leave this system and never return. Tell your brethren, in whatever dark place your kin calls home, that Slorkenberg is protected and that such will be the fate of all trespassers. I know you won't listen to my words, despite the defeat we've dealt your kind on the surface. You think yourselves safe in your ships, away from the stronghold. So I shall demonstrate that no, you aren't safe from Slorkenberg's wrath. The pilot snickered. What did that Monkey think that small vessel could do against their fleet? It didn't even look to have any weapon bigger than an anti-asteroid laser cannon. There was a flash of light, and the screams of a billion voices shaking the very darkling souls of the pilots. When their vision returned, the dark tormentor was split in two pieces rapidly falling down into the planet's atmosphere, and a crack in the fabric of the cosmos shown where the flagship had been but a heartbeat ago. A quick look at the sensors confirmed that, whatever that weapon had been, it hadn't left any of the crew alive, either and the two pilots had a feeling they knew exactly where the souls of their cable peers had ended up. The two pilots exchanged glances. So back to Comrish? asked the first. Back to Comra confirmed the second. Working together better than they ever had before, the two pilots began to turn the envenomed dagger around. Back toward the webway portal the Archon had opened within this system for the duration of the raid. Mercifully, the dark gateway was still there, meaning that at least one part of this entire operation was going as planned. The portal had been opened at great cost and effort, and was supposed to remain open for an entire fortnight before shutting down. The rest of the raiding fleet did the same, staying well clear of the dark tormentor's wreckage as they left. Their return to the dark city would be far from the triumph they had been promised. With all of its leadership gone, the days of the cabal of murderous death were numbered. The moment the news spread, its rivals would come to tear its holdings apart and plunder its resources for themselves. Their chances of surviving there were slim, and depended heavily on how much of the Cabal's treasure they managed to steal ahead of the rest to buy a place into another Cabal. But at least in the Dark City, they could only get murdered by things that made sense, like poisoned knives, splinter shots, dark matter, or if they got someone really angry at them, the occasional miniature black hole, not whatever doomsday weapon these crazy Mon K had built. Victory was theirs, and though it was a glorious thing, there was much aftermath left for Jafar and his people to deal with. Thousands had been displaced from their homes on the capital's outskirts, their habs laid waste by the rampaging orcs. The duty of caring for them while the reconstruction was ongoing fell on the bureaucracy's shoulders. The damage the Dark Elders had inflicted upon the palace was the perfect opportunity to remove the last traces of its old aesthetics, as was typical of anything constructed at the Giorbe's command, had tended rather to the gaudy and the over-ornamented too. There was also talk of trying to figure out a way to get the USA fitted with a proper air force, as the handful of transports and converted civilian aircrafts that made up its air fleet at the moment would have been completely useless had they tried to engage the Exynos gunships in combat. Still, the chief clerk had managed to steal a moment of peace amidst his many duties, which he was now using to centre his thoughts and consider all that had happened with a clear head. He had sensed Emeli's brief manifestation all the way in the command centre, recognising it at once from the hour of her ascension, which had briefly bathed the whole planet in daemonic energies. The psychic pressure of the daemon princess had also been felt by every dark elder still fighting in the palace, their shock allowing the defenders to gain the upper hand in a score of engagements, combined with the flow of reinforcements pouring from the rest of Canopolis and their fear of sharing their leader's doom. That had been enough to break the foe, who had fled back to their transports and left the city long before the handmaiden's arrival. When he'd introduced his new bloodwood, Cain had made it clear 
that he hadn't seen the Dark Elder's enslavement that was what it was, however ironic, by Lady Emile coming. Jafar believed him. But the swiftness with which the Liberator had adapted to this unforeseen development was yet another display of his mastery of intrigue, for a true mastermind needed to be able to adapt to the unexpected. By contrast, Jafar was much more sceptic of Kane's claims that he hadn't been aware of the weapon the bringers had built aboard the fist of the Liberator. No matter how good his act of being completely taken aback by the weapon's destructive power had been, it was obvious the Liberator had known all along. The idea that the Borgs could build something as devastating as the weapon had proved to be without either Jafar or Cain knowing about it was ridiculous. Which, of course, begged the question of why Cain would act as if he'd been surprised by the reveal. The only reasonable explanation Jafar could think of was that the Liberator didn't want the bringers of renewed greatness to be aware of how much he knew about their operations, which only made sense, of course, now that the chief clerk thought about it. Cain was playing a long and delicate game of balance between the council's various factions and keeping them in the dark as to the full extent of his knowledge and abilities was undoubtedly part of that. It was the same with the Valhallans. Jafar had been surprised when Cain had ordered the captive guardsmen be armed so that they could fight off the Orc Warband advancing on their prison camp. But to his surprise, they hadn't immediately escaped once the Greenskins had retreated. Instead, they'd offered their expertise in rooting out the Orcs before they could dig in and become much more difficult to fully purge. Their officers had presented their proposal as coming from the deep hatred their people felt for that particular Xenos breed, but Jafar could see the machinations of the Liberator at work, drawing the Imperials ever closer to joining their cause. Once again, the Chief Clerk was left in awe of the Liberator's schemes, like a child who has only just learned the basic rules of regicide watching a master play. The feeling only reinforced his determination to increase his own skills until he finally reached the distant stage on which Cain played. By now, his old desire of turning the Liberator into a puppet ruler had mostly faded, although if the opportunity presented itself, it would only be right for him to do so, as Slorkenberg must be ruled by the most cunning mind possible if it were to survive. Until then, he needed to sharpen his wits and increase his mastery of Tinch's arts, so that he could avoid losing standing compared to the other members of the Liberation Council. On the day following our unexpectedly easy victory against two separate Exynos incursions, I awoke with a pounding headache, the consequences of having only managed to fall asleep after getting blackout drunk in my quarters. I was only able to get up to tackle the aftermath thanks to what could only be described as frivolous use of life-saving medicine. While I couldn't claim to understand the minds of the dark age of technology men and women, I was fairly certain curing hangovers hadn't been the panacea's intended use. I had managed to get more or less used to Amelia using Christabel as a vessel during our little rendezvous was a horrifying enough thought in itself and didn't bode well for the fate of my immortal soul. But the sight of that elder's corpse being reanimated like this had been disturbing in an entirely new way. I hadn't even known she could do something like that. But then I hadn't really known whether she could do what I'd asked her to do either. Fear, exhaustion, and, to my own vague surprise, Genuine fury at that wretch vile heart's threats had pushed me to do something I had never considered before. Calling upon M.A. Lee like this had been a gamble, especially given the mysterious shadow Christabel had talked about and Emilie had mentioned herself. I had half expected for nothing to happen when I had called her name, thinking that at the very least making it look like I had a plan to prevent Vileheart's resurrection, because of course the race of pain fueled predators would be able to come back from the dead, why not would keep people from panicking long enough for me to figure something out? Instead, not only had the soul of the Dark Eldar Lord ended straight into Emelai's claws, but I had ended up with a brand new bodyguard. Much as my every instinct rebelled at the prospect of letting Azino stay close to me, let alone one whose entire species depended on the torment of others to survive, I couldn't reject a gift from Emily, not without drawing her ire and this latest demonstration of her power had been a clear reminder of how much of a bad idea that would be. Melissa was terrifying, though there was admittedly a certain degree of dark amusement to be had from the fact that, however scared of her I was, she appeared to be even more afraid of me due to how close I'd looked to be with a daemon princess dedicated to her race's nemesis. Still, 
Her fear of Emily was understandably greater still, so she looked very determined to keep me from harm which I could hardly argue against. And her knowledge of the Dark Elder Society could potentially be useful in case some other faction decided to try their hand at attacking Slorkenberg. Given what had happened to the leader of the last attempt, I couldn't see why anyone would risk it, but knew better than to take anything for granted. There hadn't been time for her to tell me much. But what little I'd learned already made me a lot more understanding of the reasons why the Inquisition kept such things from the general public. If nothing else, it certainly must cut on the use of sleeping aids and soothing medicines. Jurgen and Militia weren't exactly going along well, but the Valhallen had reluctantly conceded to her presence eventually, making it clear that their respective duties didn't intersect. He was my aid, and she was my bloodwood. Given that I could hardly imagine Militia helping me with paperwork or bringing me Resaf while I worked, that was probably best for all involved. I'd given Militia a suite next to mine in the Liberation Palace, convincing her to leave me alone after letting her do a sweep of the ex-governor's quarters to check for traps, poisons, and other threats. Of course, there was the matter of the rest of Slorkenberg's reaction to Militia's presence to consider. Only the soldiers who had participated in the Battle of the Liberation Palace had actually faced the Dark Elder, but she was hardly the most reassuring-looking creature in the galaxy. Christabel had suggested I assign her to do some public work, like assisting with the delivery of emergency supplies to those displaced by the damage the orcs had inflicted upon the capital. I was almost certain she'd been joking, though judging by the look on Melissa's face at the suggestion it would apparently have been torture for her, which given what I knew of Drukhari civilization, I supposed made sense. To address that problem, I had made up some grok shit for the masses in my victory speech, in between spouting platitudes about how, through the bravery of the USA and the ingenuity of the Borgs, we had triumphed over two of the great evils, the Imperium used to threaten its enslaved worlds into compliance. In what was possibly the single biggest lie I'd ever told since landing on this miserable planet, I claimed that upon witnessing the returned spirit of the Lady Emily. Melissa had seen the error of her kin's dark ways and pledged herself to the cause of the Liberation Council, receiving Emily's blessing to stand at my side and protect me from all who sought me harm. Somehow, it had worked. According to Jurgen's report of the rumor's mill, the succubus wasn't going to feel welcome any time soon, but at least that should prevent name-calling and stone-throwing. Not that I really cared about her being subjected to either, but I did care about needing to clean up the bloodshed that would inevitably ensue as she'd already demonstrated her martial prowess against a cluster of greenskins who had gone to ground within the city's outer perimeter, much to the amazement of the troopers. Meanwhile, the Borgs had already sent naval ships to recover pieces of the Drokhari flagship that had fallen into the ocean, combined with the various prizes taken from the Exynos corpses. Tessa Kappa's people were very enthusiastic about their future studies. I had reminded them to be very careful, as there was no telling what kind of booby trap the Dark Elders had placed inside their gear, and was almost sure they had heard me over their own greed for precious Xenotech. I had personally congratulated the Borgs who had worked on the fist of the Liberator's weapon, giving them medals along with the rest of the ship's crew for their heroic action. I had also made it clear that if they or anybody else tried to run that kind of weapons program without proper authorization again, I would have them stripped of their augmetics and dumped in the uncharted depths of Emily's gift, which might seem a bit of an overreaction, except for the fact that the weapon in question had left a scar on the very fabric of reality one that showed no sign of healing, if such a word was appropriate any time soon, and that the weapon itself had been built around a salvaged warp core from one of the destroyed ships of Karamazov's retribution fleet. As far as our aspects could tell, there was now an unstable portal leading to some other, unknowable realm of existence. It wasn't the warp. The Borgs were almost certain of that, where the Drakari flagship had been. It blazed with light like some kind of false sun, bright enough to make close inspection difficult. Thankfully, the anomaly appeared to be immobile relative to Slorkenberg's sun, a tidbit of knowledge which had caused me to suffer a lesson about the movement of stars relative to the greater galaxy, which, if nothing else, had filled me with a renewed sense of my own insignificance in the face and the immensity of the cosmos, so it would be one local year before the planet got close to it again. 
In the meantime, the local astronomers were going to have to deal with the fact that there was a new star in the night sky. There was a fierce debate raging among them as to what to classify and call it, and I wasn't convinced Jafar had been entirely pulling my leg when he told me his people had needed to get involved to keep the discussions from turning bloody. I had to admit I was impressed by the way the USA had handled themselves during the crisis. Defeating the Imperial expedition had been laughably easy due to the incompetence of its leadership, and I had expected things to go very differently against a real enemy. Instead, the troopers had held their ground against the orcs and chased off the dark Eldar raiders with minimal casualties. Most of the credit for that went to the panacea, which could heal any injury short of mutilation, including the cocktail of toxins the Dark Elder employed. But there was no denying the USA had demonstrated discipline and martial prowess that wouldn't have shamed any Imperial Guard regiment I could think of. While that was good news, since it meant I hadn't been carted off to Comrade in chains to serve as Weilhardt's plaything until he got bored, it was worrying in the long term. Instead of being terrified by their first taste of real combat like any sensible person or a coward like myself, would be the cornate lunatics were reveling in what they saw as a glorious battle and hungered for more. For now, the hunt for the fleeing greenskins would keep the troopers busy, and there was always the purging of the unmapped sections of Emily's gift to keep the most bloodthirsty occupied. But eventually they would get bored, and if there was one thing from my commissariat training that applied in my present circumstances, it was that a bored trooper was a danger to himself and everyone around him. At least I could console myself with the thought that none of those recent events had negatively affected the Imperium in any way. If anything, our defeat of the Xenos had made this corner of the galaxy safer for humanity as a whole. By removing two separate alien threats, it probably didn't make up for the Guard forces lost to Karamazov's mad crusade, but it was a start, and hopefully by the time my luck finally ran out and I had to explain myself to the God Emperor, I'd have some additional arguments to justify not being thrown into the realms of chaos for Emily to find. And while I had been surprised when the Valhallans had asked for permission to leave their compound, I'd soon realized it was merely a con to buy as much time as possible to disappear before we started hunting for them. Eventually the charade would be revealed, at which point I would make a grand speech about how disappointed I was in the lack of honor of the Imperium's lackeys, who had taken advantage of the second chance I had so generously offered to them. It would damage my reputation for infallibility a little, but I was confident I could handle it. All in all, I decided, things could have gone a great deal worse and I should be able to relax ever so slightly for the foreseeable future, confident that all urgent issues had been dealt with. I was, of course, completely wrong, but in this case ignorance was probably a blessing as it kept me from screaming and banging my head against the nearest wall until I cracked my own skull open. So. It seemed the Holy Orders had underestimated the threat posed by Syaphas Cain, and rather severely at that, he was no common heretic, that was for sure. Amberley could only take the fact that her identity as an Inquisitor had stayed secret despite being so close to him as a miracle from the Emperor. She'd departed the Liberation Palace once the emergency had passed and the shelters had opened, claiming to want to reunite with her family. Kand let her go without any issue, wishing her all the best and promising that the Liberation Council would look after the people of Canopolis. How he'd managed to say the name of the capital city with a straight face. She'd no idea. She'd thought it a trap at first. But after several days of carefully looking over her shoulder for trails and finding none, she had to accept that either Kane had bought her acting or he was playing a long game of some kind. The fact that the succubus hadn't recognized her as Vileheart's prize captive had been nothing short of a miracle, given that even the raiders had done so earlier. Amberley had some skill in making herself look like someone else, but she didn't think that would have been enough to trick a dark elder. Obtaining supplies had been easy. The government was handing food, water and other basic necessities to anyone who asked in the aftermath of the destruction the orcs had visited on the city's outskirts before their defeat. By pretending that her own home had been among the destroyed buildings, she'd been able to get access to the temporary housing set up for the displaced. After sleeping in the sparse but clean accommodations provided, she had begun her investigation of what was going on here. She'd even found a small temple to the God Emperor operating in the capital suburb, entirely in plain sight and run by a genuine priest of the Ecclesiarchy. 
Admittedly, the congregation wasn't especially numerous, but the fact it was clearly allowed to continue its activities was shocking to say the least. She had entered one of the public libraries, a concept that had honestly baffled her at first, until she'd realised the cults ran all the libraries and thus controlled access to knowledge. Except, as far from the tomes she had read, the knowledge inside hadn't been altered in any way to subtly guide readers down the path of chaos, reinforcing the hold of heresy upon the planetary population. And really, that hold didn't seem particularly strong at the present, despite the fanatical loyalty the people showed to their glorious liberator. Admittedly, Amberley hadn't visited any other world which had fallen from the Emperor's light, but she was ready to bet none of them resembled Slorkenberg. Not only were the texts made available to the population as accurate as such things tended to be on backwater imperial worlds, the open public lessons of the bringers of renewed greatness didn't contain any tech heresy. She could discern, apart from the mere fact that they shared knowledge that tech priests of Mars considered sacred and reserved to the initiated, which Amberley had always seen as more of a ploy to protect their technological monopoly than a genuine article of faith. All the stories of people being snatched off the street, never to be seen again, dated from before the rebellion, when the despised governors had let their thugs roam free, hunting down anyone who dared even utter a whisper of disapproval for the appalling way the planet had been run. There were no tales of spirits being called forth, no mass conversions to the worship of the ruinous powers. And yet, she couldn't forget the sight of the Archon's corpse rising, possessed by what had to be a powerful daemon of Slayanesh, which had called Cain beloveds, although if Cain genuinely believed a daemon was capable of love, it was much more foolish than he looked and bound a dark Yielder fighter to serving him under pain of eternal damnation. Cain had the favour of a newly ascended daemon princess of Slanesh, while at the same time enjoying the complete loyalty of the local armed forces, which were clearly under the influence of Corn, although they were much more disciplined and less kill-crazy than the minions of the blood god she had encountered before, and unless she missed her guess, the whole planetary administration was slowly being turned into a Chisentian cult from the top down. Only the followers of the plague god were denied a seat at the table, instead being the target of vehement denunciations in the sermons of every creed she had encountered. In the slowly coalescing faith of the local heretics, Nurgle was the god of despair and acceptance, whereas the Liberation Council preached mankind's ability to forge its own future, one where each day was brighter than the last. She needed to continue her investigation. This was far more important than the trafficking ring she had been tracking down before her capture. Cain had all the markings of a war master of chaos in the making, and while it had been centuries since the most infamous holder of that title had stirred from his exile in the Eye of Terror, the Imperium had more than enough other problems to deal with at the moment, because although the Liberator might not have a fraction of the sheer power of the Despoiler at his disposal, he had something arguably even more dangerous. As an Inquisitor, Amberley was well aware of how subtle the corruption of the enemies of humanity could be, but while chaos cults weren't her expertise, she had encountered enough of them during her career to realise how abnormal the situation on Slorkenberg was. When a cult, or as was the case here, a coalition of several, managed to overthrow the rightful rulers of an imperial world, things always descended into anarchy, backstabbings and unspeakable horrors unleashed upon the population through warpcraft. Yet there were none of these on Slorkenberg. Instead, cults of opposing powers were cooperating, sharing spheres of influence with what looked like less in fighting and politicking than on a typical imperial world. The followers of Korn ran the army, the cultists of Seench, the bureaucracy, and the worshippers of Slayanesh were doing charity work, organising parties and working to increase the standard of living. Meanwhile, the renegade tech priests maintained the planetary infrastructure, helped develop industry and had developed a miracle cure for all diseases which had been made freely available. There was no denying that the people of Slorkenberg weren't just happier now that they had been under imperial rule. They were also more productive, and the planet as a whole had become much more valuable under Kane's leadership than the vacation world it had previously been. And as far as Amberley could tell, this so-called Liberation Councils had accomplished all of this without summoning hordes of daemons or using any kind of infernal sorcery whatsoever. 
The implications of it all were very disturbing. While the despoiler and the traitor legions he commanded could compel people into joining chaos through fear, in the most depraved cases, sorcery, this gentle heresy had the potential to spread like wildfire across the worlds of the Imperium. And though the elder inquisitors whose meeting she'd accidentally stumbled into months ago had been confident Slorkenberg's rebellion was confined to a single star system, Amberley knew the renegades had seized several warp-capable transports thanks to Karamazov's catastrophic crusade. For now, their efforts were focused on Slorkenberg, but how long would it be before their ambitions extended beyond their borders? Something had to be done, and fast. Killing Kane seemed like the most obvious course of action. It was clear that the Liberator was the pillar on which the entire alliance of Chaos cultists rested. Without him, the entire thing would come crashing down, hopefully, in a succession crisis that would cripple the threat the system posed to the rest of the Imperium. Usually, that would be a job for the Officio Assassinorum. Technically speaking, they could only be dispatched by a vote of the High Lords, but the Inquisition had its ways. Especially when heretics and xenos were concerned, it was only when the target was still part of the Imperium that the vote was politically important. Unfortunately, Amberley had no mean of contacting them. If there were still astropaths on the planet, the Liberation Council was keeping them safely locked away. So, in the end, she would have to do it herself, which, considering how close she'd been to him, was quite infuriating. At the time, she'd been afraid of turning him into a martyr, but now that she understood more of Slorkenberg's unique brand of blasphemy against the Golden Throne, she realized he was much more dangerous to the Imperium of Man Alive than Dead. It wouldn't be easy, especially now that he had a dark elder succubus soulbound to ensure his continued existence. And even if she succeeded, her own survival was very unlikely, but it was her duty to the Emperor, and Amberly Vale would not shy from it. It would take time and preparations, but in the end, Seraphus Cain would die by her hand. For now, though, she needed to find a job. She couldn't remain dependent on the Liberation Council's generosity forever, if only out of pride. More to the point, it would help build her cover to approach her target. Fortunately, Amberly was a woman of many talents, and she'd played many roles during her career as an Inquisitor. Maybe something like a professional singer. Lord Rotkiv of the Endless Agony Coven whistled a joyful tune as he worked. The melody was nicely accompanied by the collection of groans, moans and quiet pleas for mercy from his caged gallery of test subjects. Although, really, after the time they had spent in his care, the only mercy they could hope for was death, not that he was ever going to give it to any of them. On his operation table, the Helmonculus latest subject, a pile of bleeding meat that, at some point, had been a musician of craft world. Beel Tan? Aletok? He didn't remember, twitched feebly. Rotkiv tutted in disapproval. He'd expected a much greater reaction from the symphony he was playing on the subject's nerves at the moment. A sudden noise from his collection drew his attention away from his squirming plaything. With a frown, he walked through the labyrinth of his possessions, arranged according to a system that made sense to him alone. The closer he got to the source of the sound, the clearer it became. It was a repeated, insistent tapping of bone against glass. His hands moved to one of the many devices hanging at his belt which could be used as a weapon in a pinch, one such as he wouldn't bother carrying anything so crass as to be only useful in combat after all. Soon, Rotkiv reached the source of the noise, which was amidst the pieces of those lesser Drukhari who had begged him for immortality, had some vermin slipped past his many, many defences, and was now vainly trying to get access to the frozen treats in their lockers. If so, he looked forward to cutting it open, as no ordinary beast could have made it through the traps and defences surrounding his laboratory. He strode on, his eyes piercing through the gloom with ease. Every homunculus worth the name had experimented on themselves, and perfect dark vision was among the most basic of enhancements their august brotherhood was capable of. This was where he stored the body parts of the members of the cabal of murderous death who had made accord with him. Despite the number of different cabals whose members had hired his services, Rotkiv remembered that particular contract well, for there was a dark creativity within Vileheart's soul that had impressed even him. The dread glory of the old bloodlines truly manifested within Sheev, and Rotkiv had taken great pleasure in the artwork the Archon had commissioned from him. 
like the living carpet of his throne room. Come to think of it, hadn't he heard that the cabal of murderous death was going out to raid? The Haemonculus's thoughts were interrupted by a sudden noise from his left. The sound was something between a shriek and a sigh, and felt like a pair of rusted daggers being stabbed into his ears. He recoiled from it on instinct, raising a staff that could rip all the blood out of someone's body with the same technology. It also used to take biological samples from subjects. The exsanguination field did nothing to the creature which rushed toward him, slapping the device out of his hand and breaking his wrist in the process, before lifting him up and smashing him against the opposite wall. Pain blossomed into Rotkiv's chest as razor-sharp claws punched through his bloody lab coat and into his guts, but the agony was something the Haemonculus easily ignored, made distant as it was by millennia of life and self-experimentation. Instead of wasting time screaming, he took a good look at his attacker. It was huge, but lithe and appeared made of stitched body parts and flowing shadows. Two emerald eyes blazed within its skull, which was covered in what Rotkiv's experienced eyes took only a moment to recognize as the stretched, flayed skin of Sheev Vileheart's face. Behind the monster, he could see the shattered remnants of the containers which had held the flesh of the cabal of murderous death's leadership, ruined beyond any hope of recovery. Hello, Rokiv. It said through a pair of lips that were entirely too voluptuous compared to the rest of its body. The Dark Prince has been waiting for you for a long, long time. This is not possible. He protested weakly as black blood poured out of his wounds and mouth. You cannot be here. And it was impossible. If Daemons had been capable of entering Comra, the whole of the Dark City would have been lost thousands of years ago. The entire pocket reality in which the capital of the Drakari existed was warded beyond anything the lesser races could even conceive of, and no amount of effort was ever spared in maintaining and reinforcing these protections, for every Dark Elder knew the doom that awaited them all should they fail. All things are possible through the power of love. Little Haemonculus purred the daemon, and it is in the name of my love that I've come to end you and all your works. I don't understand, gasped Rotkiv, as its claws buried deeper into his chest. All around him, he could see his precious laboratory being destroyed as rampant warp energies caused complex, priceless equipment, as which predated the fall and had been acquired at the cost of entire worlds worth of suffering to malfunction. In their cages, things that had been denied the release of death for longer than some of the galaxy's sentient races had existed sighed in relief as oblivion beckoned. I know, said the daemon, but you will, though it will not help you. Then there was pain, darkness, and greater pain still. And this time, Rotkiv of the Endless Agony did scream just as his uncounted victims had screamed over the ages. The vast plains of Slorkenberg were covered in snow as the winter season rolled across the hemisphere. In the months since the double Zeno's attack, life had returned to normal, the people of Slorkenberg continuing to work toward building a better future to the surprise of many. The Valhalan captives had honored their promise and returned the weapons which had been given to them in order to defend themselves from the orcs in yet another demonstration of how much of an excellent judge of character the Liberator was. The guardsmen had even volunteered their expertise in tracking down the remaining greenskins who had fled into the wilderness like cowards while the USA was responding to the Dark Elder raid on the Liberation Palace. There had been some reluctance on the part of the USA at first, which had promptly vanished once the Liberator had expressed his complete support of the idea. The resulting purge of the Greenskins had directly led to the Bringer's discovery of the Exeno's strange biology and reproductive mechanism, leading to the cleansing of the affected areas with fire to ensure none of the beast's spores were able to take root. The fact that the Valhallans themselves had no idea about why their traditions demanded all orc corpses be burned was, in the eyes of many, yet another sign of the Imperium's decrepitude. How many worlds, having successfully repelled an orcish invasion, had then been plagued by resurgent greenskin tribes generations later, all because their distant masters either didn't know something the Borgs had figured out in weeks, or simply didn't bother informing the rest of the Imperium of Gerb. Mankind had faced the Orcs since it had first left Holy Terror. The idea that nobody had ever discovered this before was patently absurd. New wonders continued to emerge from the Bringer's research facilities, 
As Slokenberg's available manpower dwindled as the planet's economy grew, the new factories were more and more automated, using automation to greater and greater effects. It was to the point that a plant that, before the uprising, there hadn't been many of these prior to the geobase overthrow, but there had still been some, would have required hundreds of unskilled laborers and servitors, now needed only a few scores of maintenance personnel and techno-overseers, with the use of servitors completely abandoned. Salvage teams had been sent to search the ocean for pieces of the dark Elder flagship, which had survived atmospheric re-entry. Very few had. But rumor had it that a small handful of interesting artifacts had been recovered by the ongoing efforts, sent to the bringer's facilities for studies. Speculation was rife as to what secrets the liberated tech priests would manage to pry from this echinotech, as wild stories of the Druckery's technological capabilities had spread throughout the world. The outer districts of the planetary capital, which had long suffered from neglect under the Jorbas' cruel and incompetent rule, had been badly damaged during the ground battle against the orcs. However brief it had ended up being, reconstruction was proceeding apace, and the Liberation Council had decided to use the opportunity to redesign the ravaged areas completely, following architectural designs much more comfortable and elegant than what had existed before. Yet though all these events were worth celebrating in their own right, it was not them which were honoured today, as a great celebration was being prepared in the city of Canopolis. Instead, the party taking place within the Liberation Palace and emulated in a score of other locations throughout the capital was being thrown in honour of the Liberator himself. According to the story that had spread across the planet like wildfire, a week ago Cain had offhandedly congratulated one of the many aides to the council for the eighth name day of his son. Later that same day, the aide had realized he didn't know the Liberator's own name day, and upon investigating, discovered that nobody else did. Immediately, the clerk had shared this disturbing information with his peers, and word had spread like wildfire, triggering a great outcry that this injustice be corrected. As was typical of his modest, self-effacing manner, the Liberator had protested. He'd claimed that his own birth was nothing worth celebrating, and the exact date was long lost to imperial record-keeping and the vagaries of warp travel anyway. But, faced with the enthusiasm and devotion of the people, he'd relented, and the rest of the Liberation Council had decreed that the day of his arrival according to the local calendar which, for various administrative reasons, was used alongside the standard imperial one in most official documents would henceforth be treated as Syaphus Cain's name day and celebrated accordingly. Great feasts and thanksgiving would take place, with the new faiths in particular holding ceremonies where they gave thanks to the various powers they worshipped for bringing the Liberator to Slorkenberg. The handmaidens of Emily organized many of these, coordinating with local authorities worldwide, but none of the celebrations matched the one taking place in the Liberation Palace, which would be attended by Cain himself. As the sun reached its zenith, the parties began set to run throughout the entire afternoon and night. In her years as an inquisitor, Amberley had attended many parties thrown by the rich and powerful of the Imperium, she could say with confidence that none of them had been quite like this one. And it wasn't only because the one being celebrated was a heretic leader and all those taking part traitors to the throne. The party was lavish, but not to the point of being ostentatious. There was a buffet covered in food and drink, but no servants walking around with platters. You had to actually walk over there and serve yourself. Knowing Cain, this was probably some subtle metaphor for Slorkenberg's ideals, something about how the Liberation Council provided opportunities for all. But you still needed to seize them yourself in order for the whole thing to work, or something like that. Or perhaps she was reading too much into it, and it was just a random decision that had nothing to do with the Liberator. That was possible too, especially since this party was taking place in his honor, so it was unlikely he'd participated in the preparations. Looking around at the other guests, it was obvious that Kain had a level of popularity no imperial governor could ever dream of. The joy, respect and love these people felt for the Liberator weren't faked, but genuine, just like those of every citizen she'd encountered in the last few months. The Inquisitor had suspected some kind of sorcerous mind control was in play at first, but had found no evidence of such. Kane was just that charismatic and competent a ruler. 
In one room, thousands of letters written by children who had only been able to start learning their letters after the uprising had been placed on the walls, each one thanking the Liberator for how he had improved their lives and those of their families, and unlike what she'd have bet on had this all taken place on an imperial world. Amberley knew no one had been compelled into writing these earnest, oft-misspelled letters. Despite her best efforts, Amberley couldn't stop herself from comparing the love, devotion, and simple happiness of Slorkenberg's people with what she'd encountered on so many imperial worlds. Of course, her own experience was biased, since an inquisitor was rarely needed on happy, prosperous worlds. But wasn't that the A problem as well? That such places existed that needed her kind in the first place? She forced herself to turn away from such thoughts. She couldn't afford to get distracted. Not here. In the very heart of the gentle heresy that had caught Slorkenberg in its embrace, she had a mission, and she would carry it out, regardless of the cost. Getting into the Liberation Palace had been surprisingly easy. Amberley hadn't even had to steal one or scheme her way in as someone else's plus one. She'd been formally invited to perform on stage and join the party afterwards. She was still vaguely surprised that her attempt to get by using the singing skills she'd trained as a hobby over the years had worked so well. Perhaps that made sense. Before the uprising, Slorkenberg's art scene had been limited to the decadence of the Jilbars and whatever pet artists were brought along by off-world nobles. The Celts of Slayanesh were working hard to develop the art scene. True, but her experience still gave her an advantage. Taking a deep breath, Amberley emerged from the backstage and into the small scene which had been prepared for her. A spotlight fell down on her from above while the rest of the room darkened slightly. The noise of many conversations died down, and Amberley began to sing. It was, in her own opinion, her best performance ever. The knowledge of her own, most likely. For though her odds of success were rather good for something she'd arranged on her own without backup, her odds of survival were significantly less so imminent death, lent a depth of emotion to her voice she couldn't ever have faked. Judging by the thunderous applause as she finished her rendition of The Love We Share, the audience shared her opinion. As she came down the stage, Kane himself approached, his psycho aide and Zenos Bloodwood close at hand. The wyke was the object of many glances, varying from the fearful and the wary to the curious and hateful, but nobody appeared to openly object to her presence. Miss Vale, he greeted her with a smile. What a pleasant surprise. I didn't know you were a professional singer. Lord Kane, she replied with an elegant curtsy. It is a recent change in career, but I found I enjoy it greatly. And you are very talented. He complimented her. I don't think I've ever heard such a beautiful rendition of that old song. I could really hear the feelings you put into those lyrics. Surely you know more of love than I ever could, she said. Bashful, after all, yours transcend even the boundary between life and death. Does it not? My relationship with Amelia is complicated he said with a wistful look on his face, before shaking his head and turning to his aide. Jurgen, could you please fetch us some drinks? Of course, sir. Amberley counted the seconds as the psycho departed, all while continuing making small talk with Kane about her singing career. When, by her estimation, he'd reached the bar and was as far away as he was going to get, she crossed her hands behind her back and pressed a remote she had sewn into her sleeve. Immediately, the bomb she had hidden in the palace's outskirts three days ago detonated. It wasn't going to do much damage, but then that wasn't its purpose. Instead, she had assembled it to make as much noise and create as much smoke as possible. Immediately, the party stopped, voices raising in panic and alarm. Khan turned sharply in the direction of the sound. Melissa, he said, his voice the very picture of calm. I'm on it, replied the witch before dashing off toward the explosion and leaving her principal alone with Amberley. A true bodyguard wouldn't have made such a mistake, but for all her lethality, the Drakari was still new to her role. Her instincts were pulling her toward the threat, which was what Amberley had been counting on. No matter how well trained the Inquisitor was, she didn't fancy pitting her own human reflexes against the Wyke's alien ones. Don't worry, Miss Vale. Kane told her with a smile. I promise I'll keep you safe. I know, she replied, faking the slight trembling of someone not quite managing to hide their fear. Kane nodded, before gently pulling her away from the ballroom and onto a small balcony. 
There, he put himself between her and the rest of the room, hands moving toward the weapons at his belt, not drawing them but ready to do so at a moment's notice. This was even better than she'd hoped for. With the succubus gone, both of Kane's companions were out of the way, while in the ballroom, everyone was focused on the source of the noise. That wouldn't last long. Soon, they'd start looking for their beloved liberator. But right now, she had a small window of opportunity. The results of months of building up her cover. Amberly activated her subdermal implants, and a thin blade emerged from between the knuckles of her closed fist, the synthetic skin parting to let it pass. However small and fragile it might look, it was still monomolecular edged, capable of cutting through anything, be it the lock of a druckery cage or the necks of the druckery themselves. Dressed in an ornate ceremonial uniform as he was, Kane didn't stand a chance. She struck, aiming for the base of the liberator's neck. Given how effective Slorkenberg's healthcare was, she would need to be thorough to ensure he didn't recover. Suddenly, Kane turned back to face her, his hand snaking up to catch her wrist, stopping her blade mere millimetres from his throat. Amberley had trained her body to the peak of human capabilities, but Kane's grip was like adamantium. He stared down at her, his face a mask of stone. Snarling, Amberley brought up her free hand. That one didn't have an implanted weapon, but she had sharpened her nails to a razor's edge just in case. It was going to be messy, but maybe she could still tear his throat out. Yet before she could reach him, her hand stopped in midair, caught in an invisible grip no less strong than Kane's. Sir, Amberley heard the voice of the Liberator's aide, sounding only mildly concerned, and her heart sank. What's going on? It appears there is more to Miss Vale than meets the eye, said Kane, still looking down at her. I don't suppose you would be willing to just tell me who sent you? Amberley quickly made a decision and activated her inquisitorial elec too, flaring the sigil of the holy ordos in her palm. I am Inquisitor Amberly Vale of the Ordos Sinos, she declared defiantly, staring the arch-heretic dead in the eyes. And I came here to kill you, Jephas Cain, for your betrayal of your oaths and heresy against the Golden Throne. She was hoping to shake the pair of heretics enough that she could slip either of their grasp and finish the job before the psyker tore her apart. Yet to her surprise, Can merely raised an eyebrow at the sight of the Holy Ordus emblem, and Jurgen didn't relax his psychic hold in the slightest. Ah, uh, the Liberator simply said, I see. That does make things a tad more complicated. Jurgen, if you would. Something squeezed Amberley's mind, and then there was only darkness, with her last thought being shame that, once again, she'd failed in her Emperor-given task. Too close. That had been far too close. If I hadn't decided to use the pretext of getting Miss Vale further away from the ballroom and whatever scheme had caused the explosion, causing me to turn just in time to catch her assassination attempt, I would be explaining myself to the Emperor by now. And given that it was credits to Carrots that the female Inquisitor would have promptly been sent there as well by Jurgen, Militia, or any of the palace guards seeking to avenge the death of their beloved Liberator, my chances of getting him to see things from my perspective would have been slim, to say the least. And had Jurgen not come back with the drinks, I had sent him away to get in the foolish belief that I was safe in the heart of the Liberation Council's power during a celebration of my own Namday. It was a coin toss whether I would have blocked her second blow or not. She was fast, and while I was no slouch myself thanks to my regular training, our respective positions had made reaching for her left hand difficult. Now that the spike of adrenaline which had let me project a mask of calm through the event was gone, the sheer terror of how near I had come to death was hitting me with full force. It was an hour or so after Jurgen had rendered Miss Vale unconscious, and I sat in one of the Liberation Palace's many side rooms, nursing a glass of Amasek and looking at the data slate containing the report of the Borgs I had tasked with disabling her implants, which, while nowhere near as comprehensive as those of even the lowest-ranking tech priest, were apparently of a much higher quality, which was only to be expected if her claims of being an Inquisitor were to be believed. Outside this room and across the city, the celebrations were continuing. I had given the order to announce the explosion to be the result of an entirely innocent accident. As for my own absence from the festivities, I'd sent word to the rest of the council as to what had happened, but told them to keep quiet about it for now. 
I didn't doubt for a moment that the rest of the guests would see me and the beautiful singer missing after I had taken her aside and draw conclusions themselves, which might do some harm to my image as someone entirely dedicated to the memory of his supposedly dead beloved lady, but at the moment that thought was rather low on my list of concerns. The galing thing was I hadn't even considered such an outcome when I had started talking with her. I had genuinely enjoyed her singing and wanted to congratulate her, while discreetly trying to keep her away from being recruited by the handmaidens or one of their subordinate cults. I had no idea how Emily would react to me gallivanting with women whose bodies she wasn't using as vessels for her essence, and I didn't want to find out the hard way. Thankfully Christabel knew the truth, so I needn't worry about the dame and princess of Slayanish getting jealous like we were in some demented comedy play. You know, Lysia said suddenly from where she stood in the room, I think I know how that Inquisitor came to this world. I blinked. That had been one of the questions on my mind. Elaborate, please? I learned Vileheart had a captive Inquisitor on his ship. That must have been her. And you didn't tell me, I asked, forcing my voice to remain calm with practiced ease. She shrugged, mimicking the human gesture passingly well. But I could detect a current of unease in her. She was afraid of me, however she hid it. The job, which had been given to her by a creature capable of devouring her soul, was to keep me safe. Yet she hadn't been there when I had faced the first threat to my life since her forceful recruitment. I could see why she might be worried, and I might have felt sorry for her if she wasn't a cruel, vicious Senos who quite literally fed on the pain of her victims and had taken part in Emperor knew how many successful raids before. As it was, I had to admit to feeling a certain dark amusement at seeing her squirm. I wasn't actually going to do anything to her as punishment, of course. All it would take was one moment of her hatred for me overriding her self-preservation, and she could kill me before I had time to blink. Emily might drag her soul to the warp for an eternity of damnation as punishment, but I would still be dead. I never saw her on the dark tormentor. She pointed out, I just assumed she died when you destroyed it. Oh, so by giving the order to fire the Borg weapon, I'd almost killed a second Inquisitor without even knowing it. Brilliant. You might think that it wasn't as if the Inquisition could want me dead any more than it already did, but I was still clinging to the hope that Karamazov hadn't exactly been the most popular member of that exclusive club. Then another thought struck me, and I frowned. If she was on Vileheart's flagship, then how did she escape? I'm assuming your folk are good at keeping prisoners locked up, especially valuable ones. I would have thought it impossible, she agreed. But I've recently been forced to reconsider everything I thought I knew about your people, and she clearly is resourceful. Which was probably as close to a compliment as she was capable of giving to a lowly human being like myself. Well, she'd have to be, as an inquisitor, I muttered to myself. What are you going to do with her? asked Militia. That was the question, wasn't it? Even if she had tried to kill me, I didn't want her dead. For one thing, I could hardly blame her for trying to kill someone who had not only killed one of her peers after allegedly led a planet into rebellion, but who'd also performed a daemonic summoning right in front of her eyes. As a commissar, it would have been my job to shoot any sanctioned psyker doing the same on the spot that I'd ever had any intention to be so close to so dangerous an occurrence which given how my life was going was yet another sign that the Emperor had it out for me. And as an Inquisitor, she likely considered it her Emperor-given duty. I had to respect that level of commitment, even if I had never even remotely approached it myself. On the other hand, I couldn't just let her go. Well, I could. I was confident nobody would stop me so long as I claimed to have some kind of nefarious, long-term, secret scheme in mind but that would hardly be helpful to my health since she was all but certain to try again, and I refused to go down as some kind of idiot who encouraged others to try to kill him just to keep myself and my untries shut. I supposed I could keep her imprisoned indefinitely and claim to be working to turn her against the Imperium so nobody questioned why I hadn't executed her or tortured her for information. Of course, the latter would never have worked anyway. It was well known that Inquisitors were masters of interrogation, and anything my little bands of madmen and heretics could have conjured would have been laughable in comparison, unless we involved Emily. but my soul wasn't so far lost that I would consider such a thing. 
The best scenario would have been to convince her that I was still loyal to the Emperor before escaping this madhouse together, with my assistance in surviving this mess serving as proof of my loyalty. Unfortunately, her witnessing the whole thing with Emily and Vileheart had probably put any chance of that happening to rest, unless Inquisitors were much more flexible on theological matters than I had been led to believe. I was still pondering my options, and failing miserably to find a satisfying one, when there was the sound of a knock. It didn't come from the door, behind which Jurgen was still keeping watch, but from a closet on the other side of the room I say closet, but this was still a governor's palace. There was enough space in there for a family of four under hivers. Militia reacted at once, drawing her weapons and leaping across the room to position herself between me and the wooden panel. The closet opened, and a figure dressed in what I could only describe as a clown outfit from the festivals I had managed to sneak out of the scola to attend emerged. Harlequin, Militia hissed at the sight. Oh, so the intruder was a Zanus. The clothes made it impossible to tell, though as it walked out, its motions betrayed the same kind of fluid inhuman grace Melissia herself possessed. Absolutely brilliant. I put down my glass of Amasek and moved my hands to the weapons at my belt. The intruder hadn't made any hostile move yet, but it had somehow passed through the security of the entire palace and hid inside that closet for Emperor knew how long. It would be just my luck to survive an imperial assassination attempt, only to get done in by a Xenos killer sent by the survivors of the Dark Elder Raiding Force. Who are you? And what are you doing here? I asked. The Harlequin bowed deeply, and I sensed the surprise in Militia's body language, though her caution didn't diminish. Lord Liberator, I am Lerahaz of the Mask of the Veiled Path, and I have come to bargain. Amberley was mildly surprised that she awoke at all. Part of her having expected Kane's dark elder bodyguard to rip her to shreds while she was unconscious for daring to threaten the being whose continued existence was the only thing keeping her from being devoured by a daemon princess of Slayanish. Her surprise doubled when she realized all her wounds were gone, and doubled again when she looked around and saw that she wasn't in some dark and foreboding cell but instead laying in a comfortable bed in a small, windowless room. She immediately noticed that her implants were gone, yet there was no pain, not even a scar where they had been removed. So whatever game Kane was playing, it most likely didn't involve torturing her in the immediate future, unless this was a ruse to make her lower her guard, but the Liberator struck her as too cunning a manipulator to attempt such crude tactics on an Inquisitor. Until the very moment she'd made her move, she'd been convinced he'd completely bought her cover story. But instead, he'd been on his guard all along, waiting for her to act and confirm his suspicions. You are awake. Good. Amberly barely suppressed a jump as the voice surprised her. Kane's aide was standing next to the door, looking at her with a neutral expression that nonetheless exuded an air of menace, the likes of which Amberly had rarely encountered. Jurgen Ray had learned his name during her investigation, was famous on Slorkenberg as a powerful psyker whose loyalty to the Liberator was beyond question. Back during the Drakari incursion, he'd apparently been too tired from fighting off a bunch of orc psychers to assist, but now he was at full strength. In her present state, Amberley didn't doubt for a moment that he could neutralize or kill her with a thought. Fortunately, he didn't seem inclined to do so at the moment, despite the fact Amberley had just tried to kill the man he'd sworn himself to. Instead, he inclined his head toward a door on the other side of the room. Please refresh and dress yourself, miss. The Liberator has invited you to join him for dinner. Knowing better than to argue at this stage, Amberley got up and went into the small, windowless bathroom. There was another dress there waiting for her, of the same quality as the one she'd worn earlier today, and it had been today. She wasn't thirsty or hungry enough for it to have been more than a few hours, and Jurgen had mentioned dinner. Once she was ready, Jurgen escorted her politely but firmly outside the chamber and across a series of empty corridors, eventually bringing her to a well-appointed dining room. Kane sat at the other end of the table, his white bloodwood standing next to him, glaring daggers at Amberley. And there, seated to the Liberator's right, was the accursed Harlequin who'd captured the Inquisitor, handed her to the Drakari, then aided her escape from their ship for some unknowable reasons. Her blood ran cold at the sight of the Xenos's colorful outfit. Inquisitor Vale, Cain greeted her with a smile. How good of you to join us. 
Aren't you missing your own name day celebration? She asked. Don't worry about that. He waved off her concerns. I spent time with everyone while you were unconscious. Things have calmed down a little for now as everyone is preparing for the nocturnal festivities. This little diversion will be dealt with by the time I'm expected to return, although it is a shame you will have to miss on it all. Amberly internally shivered at the implied threat. Ah, uh, but where are my manners? I haven't even introduced you. This is Sir Leorejas of the Veiled Path. I believe the two of you are already acquainted. We are, she replied, glaring at the harlequin, whose mask revealed nothing of his thoughts. I understand that your previous encounters have been far from pleasant, but you should know that it was Sir Leorejas who bargained not just for your continued life, but for your freedom as well, said Cain. When we are done here, he will take you away with him, the same way he presumably used to get here in the first place. And what price did that Sinos pay for this? asked Amberly warily. One worthy of a soul such as yours, replied the Harlequin with an inclination of the head, and one that would in other times and places have caused wars to erupt. You heard him, said Cain, amused. If you want more details, you should ask him later. For now, please have a seat. The cooks have really outdone themselves today. After a moment's hesitation, Amberley decided the food was unlikely to be poisoned. If Cain wanted her dead or drugged, he'd plenty of opportunities to do it while she was unconscious. Once she was seated, Jurgen brought in the food, serving all three of them, even the harlequin who eat with the manners of a spire-born noble, his fork passing right through his mask and into his mouth. Cain was right. It was very good. You have been on our fair planet for several months now, said the Liberator as they finished the dessert. Tell me, what do you think of it? It is quite nice, she admitted, before taking a drink of Amasek, putting her glass down and deciding she might as well be completely honest and see where it led her. A shame about the daemon worshipping scum running the place, though. Instead of turning purple with rage at the insult, Cain merely chuckled. Yes, that is about the response I expected. Nor do I blame you for it. I know full well how deeply imperial conditioning runs. If nothing else, I admire your courage in speaking so freely in front of me. I suppose not many do these days. She asked with a caustic smile. Oh, nothing of the sort, he replied with a dismissive wave. I've made sure the Liberation Council know to speak honestly to me. People telling those in power only what they want to hear because they're afraid of being punished for telling the truth is how you end up with the Jorbas. Fair point, Amberley admitted. I admit I'm surprised, though. From what I heard, the last Inquisitor to come to Slorkenberg wasn't given such pleasant treatment. Well, not only are you much more pleasing to the eye than Karamazov was, you also haven't threatened to burn this world and everyone on it like a petulant child throwing a tantrum replied Cain. I tried to kill you. She pointed out. I was trained by the commissariat, he said with a small smile. I expected people to try to kill me while I am doing my job. Doing your job? Is that what you call of this? Wouldn't you? He challenged her. Look me in the eye and tell me I wasn't doing the Imperium a favor when I shot Cesario Vigiorba and stabbed Karamazov. Despite knowing the man sitting in front of her was the most dangerous heretic she'd ever met, Amberley couldn't bring herself to argue the point. She'd dug into Slorkenberg's history enough to know that where it came to the former planetary governor, the propaganda of the Liberation Council didn't need to exaggerate anything. And she knew about how much damage to imperial efforts in the sector Karamazov had caused with his stupidity before his forces had even reached Slorkenberg. At the same time, however, she wouldn't be an inquisitor if something like this was enough to shake her faith in the Imperium. I won't argue that these two men deserve to die, but that doesn't make you any better, she said. You follow the ruinous powers, the dark gods of chaos, the archony of humanity. Everything you have built on Slorkenberg is at best a lure to deceive others into following your example and turning against the god emperor, or far more likely merely the prelude to the unleashing of such horror as to make the Jilbar's depredations pale in comparison. Is that how you justify it? The Imperium is bad, but everything else would be worse? What kind of reasoning is that? Where is the line between the atrocities of the Imperium and those it ascribes to its enemies? Then, wherever the Emperor wills it, she replied on reflex, 
Kane sighed theatrically. A perfect answer, exactly like what the abbot at the Scola would expect, he said mockingly. But let me tell you something else, Inquisitor. You have, of course, heard about the panacea? She nodded. It was pointless to deny it. Everyone on Slorkenberg knew about the heretic's incredible invention, capable of healing any wound, curing any ill. It was used in every public hospital, and in such quantities that all but the most banal of ailments were treated with it. So far, Amberley had managed to keep herself safe from anything that would require her to be injected with it, as she was deeply suspicious of such a miracle cure. Wait, her implants were gone and she had no scars, despite the surgery that removed them taking place only a handful of hours earlier. Did that mean... Yes, Inquisitor. We did use the panacea on you while you were unconscious. Otherwise, I've been told it would be several weeks before you could handle your own cutlery. And I didn't feel like waiting that long to have dinner with you. Don't worry, he smiled. It isn't rooted in sorcery, nor does it have any hidden side effect. How do you know that? She countered. It is the work of your heretics, is it not? No, Inquisitor. It isn't surprising you didn't know, but despite what was told to the public, the bringers of renewed greatness didn't actually invent the panacea. Instead, it was discovered aboard Emily's gift when I led our very first expedition aboard the Space Hulk. Amberley's breath caught in her throat. No, he couldn't be implying what she thought he was. Surely not. I see you've realized. The bastard continued with a knowing smile. Yes, Inquisitor. The panacea is based on a standard template construct. A full, intact, and uncorrupted CRC from the Dark Age of technology containing everything needed to create the serum which has banished sickness from this world and lets us heal any injury. Throne of Terror To think that such a wonder had ended up in the hands of a small rebellion in the back end of nowhere. When the uprising happened, Slorkenberg wasn't a well-developed world, King continued. Even now, despite the work of the bringers and the common folk, our industrial base remains but a tiny fraction of a hive world's, let alone a forge world's. Yet we still manage to produce enough panacea to distribute it to the population freely, while building up our stores for military emergency use. And if we can do that much here, then, well, can you imagine it, Inquisitor? You saw for yourself how effective the panacea is when we fought the Drakari and have tasted its boons for yourself now. How many imperial citizens would be saved from plague in crowded hive worlds? How many guardsmen who die every year who might survive if they had access to it? How many worlds which fell might be saved by these same soldiers? She could. It was a heady vision of a reinvigorated mankind free of disease and injury. She lacked the proper training to calculate the full impact of a galaxy-scale integration of the technology but she didn't need it to realize how much it would change the Imperium. Then Kane slammed his fist onto the table, shaking the plates and cracking the wood under the tablecloth. All of this, the Imperium could have had centuries ago, he hissed, because guess what? The Panacea SDC we found aboard Emily's gift wasn't the first mankind rediscovered, which, given how useful such technology is, only makes sense. It was Militia who told me about it. Apparently, it is a well-known tale in Comora, which meant no one who wasn't a Drakari would enjoy it. Amberley knew. The Panacea RTC was discovered on a forge world centuries ago, but because the high fabricator of Verda Grisix was more interested in keeping the ST in a temple for worship, in ensuring the supremacy of his forge world and his own fame, he didn't do the obvious thing and send copies to every imperial world he could reach. And so, when the Dark Elders came to steal it, its secrets were lost. He sat back into his chair, suddenly sounding exhausted, defeated almost. Humanity's salvation slipping from between our fingers, just like that, and I cannot help but wonder, how many times has such a thing happened in the last ten thousand years? How often does the Imperium's blindness and stubborn dogma make it turn away from another, better path than now? And now... Here we are ten thousand years later, beset on all fronts, ever growing weaker and more ignorant, looking up to our forebears as legends while forgetting that they were only human beings too, and that anything they could achieve is also within our power. Mankind cannot continue as it has, Inquisitor. Ignorance and tyranny may be sufficient to maintaining the status quo, but survival is not enough, 
and even that won't be guaranteed much longer. And your solution is to turn to daemons for aid. Amberly forced herself to say, to auction your soul to the denizens of the warp in some kind of infernal bidding war? I can't say I've heard it described like that before. The Liberator mused. But no, that isn't my solution. I am merely looking for a way out of the trap, Miss Vale. Jurgen, please bring it in. The psyker brought up another silver platter, covered in a white cloth, which he removed to reveal a circular device of human make, despite not being trained in the ways of the Mechanicus. Amberly could tell, just by looking at it, that this was Archaeotech of the highest calibre. This Inquisitor Vale is the Panacea Esti, declared Kane, uncorrupted, untainted, and undamaged. And I want you to take it with you when you leave. Why? Amberly managed to ask. Why would you do such a thing? Two reasons, he explained. The first is that, bluntly speaking, we don't need it anymore. We have copied the full contents of the Panacea SDC many times over with countless backups, nothing save for the complete destruction of Slorkenberg, and every ship in the system will deprive us from that knowledge. However, I never full well how far the Mechanicus will go to reclaim it when they learn of its existence. So far, our isolation has served us well, and masking the panacea as the bringer's creation added another layer of obfuscation, but Vileheart knew about it when he attacked, so the secret is already out. Inevitably, the Martians will learn of it too. Having the original CC out of our hands will take the heat off us? And what's the second reason? she asked. Kane laughed sadly. Is it really that difficult to guess? You have lived among us for some time. You are an inquisitor. You must have spent all that time studying us, learning everything you could about us. Use that information, Miss Vale. Make a guess. Murgle. The other three dark gods have cultists on this world, but not the fourth. Exactly, nodded Cain. The Lord of Decay feeds on the misery and suffering of the Imperium. He grows strong on the plagues that ravage entire underhives, on the despair that afflicts uncounted trillions who never saw natural sunlight and whose bodies slowly break down as a result of their misery. His gifts do not bring hope or strength, only a bitter, pathetic acceptance of one's suffering and a desire to inflict it on all others. Nurgle has no place on Slorkenberg, the Liberator declared eyes aflame with zeal. For the first time since she had met him, Amberly saw what his scholar tutors must have seen in him when they had assigned him to the path of a commissar. He has no place on any human world, in any human soul. Since before the uprising I have fought against his dupes, but it is not enough. There can be no hope for mankind while Nurgle remains in the great game, poisoning all efforts to drag the species out of the mire of despair, and stasis in which we've been trapped since the Emperor last walked among us and the panacea is possibly the single greatest weapon in existence against the plague god. With it, we have eradicated all but the meanest remnant of his influence on our world. By giving it to you, it is my fervent hope that you will do the same on countless other worlds. Madness, Amberly thought. She was no member of the Ordo Heretis or Malleus, but she knew of the dark gods, and only the emperor himself had the strength to fight them. Mere mortals such as them could only hope to fight back against their mortal thralls and daemons, and the latter came at a terrible risk and cost. And yet, looking at Shyfus Cain in that moment, she found to her own shock that she almost believed him when he declared war against the Lord of Decay. No, worse than that. She wanted to believe him, to think that humanity could hope for more than a bloody, unending stalemate against the hosts of the Outer Dark. Or perhaps I've misjudged you, and you will do the same as that long-dead Arch Margos, and keep the STC for yourself, using it for your own advancement in the Imperium's self-destructive politics, Kane sighed. It would be deeply disappointing, but at least Slorkenberg would be safe from the Mechanicus's selfish greed. Standing up, the last of the food forgotten in her plate, Amberly picked up the device. It was surprisingly light, for all the promise it contained. I believe it's time for you two to leave, said Kane, as he and Lirahaz rose to their feet, the Harlequin all but dancing to Amberley's side. I wish you good luck in your future endeavours, Miss Vale. May the Emperor watch over you. I would wish you the same, but I fear your infernal patrons would be offended, she reposted. Again, Kane merely continued to smile, as if to a joke only he was getting. 
Leah Rahaz made a strange, arcane gesture as some of the jewels embroidered in his clothing shone with eldritch light, and a circular hole in space appeared in the room. This Amberley recognized was a webway portal. Although she had only read about such things, and was pretty sure very few elders had the means of opening them so casually instead of relying on the remaining infrastructure from their long-dead empire. Lerahaz turned to look at her, and she knew that he too was smiling under his mask. After you, Lady Vale, he told her, wind the gap, and don't go off running without me. I would find you, of course, but whether I'd manage to do so before you were found by something else less friendly is far from certain. Amberley glanced at Kane, who raised his glass in a toast to her, still with that infuriating smirk on his face. Refusing to show any weakness by hesitating, she straightened her back and walked right through the portal without looking back. I breathed a sigh of relief as Lyra has followed after Amberley with one last elaborate bow in my direction, and the webway portal closed with a sound between the whisper of the wind and a distant thunderclap. I still had no idea what game the Harlequin was playing. From what I'd pieced together, he'd arranged for the Inquisitor to be captured by Vileheart in the first place, then helped her get to the palace during the raid, only to show up now to exchange the Panacea Stee apparently. There had been some kind of disturbance in Comora recently, and the Harlequins had used the distraction to infiltrate the vault containing the Stee H.E. for her life and freedom. Well, her freedom to go with him, which might not be quite the same thing. He had to have some kind of plan in all this, but try as I might, I couldn't figure out what it was. From where I was standing, he could just have handed her the panacea steed directly. According to Militia, the Harlequins were well known among her people for their seemingly nonsensical actions, whose purpose only became clear much, much later when it ever did. It was unfortunate that I hadn't been able to hand the Ansible's schematics to the Inquisitor along with the panacea steed, based on my admittedly limited perspective and clearly very flawed judgment the Imperium stood even more to gain from their widespread use than it did the Panaceas. But while I could justify giving away the latters as a long-term move against Nurgle, there was no such convenient explanation for the Aftel communicators. I didn't exactly enjoy the thought that the Harlequin had, in all likelihood known exactly how I would react to his present, but the opportunity to do something undeniably beneficial to the Imperium while reducing my chances of being turned into a servitor by a Mechanicus crusade, all in a way that I was confident I could sell to the lunatics around me, had been too good to pass up. Of course, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, an expression I'd never heard before being taken out of the underhive and into the scholar, but which I felt fitted the present circumstances. Amberley's suggestion that the Dark Gods were using me and Slorkenberg in general as some kind of bait, a pretty mask to draw others away from the God Emperor's light and into their embrace, had hit closer to home than I had let it appear. It was an idea that I'd already had myself during the sleepless nights that had become all too frequent since my arrival on the miserable planet. Most of the time, I managed to tell myself the Dark Gods weren't capable of such long-term cooperation for so little gain, the only times the fractious servants of the ruinous powers collaborated was during the infamous Black Crusades, and the uprising was nothing compared to Abaddon's tantrums. The idea that three of the four would cooperate on something like this was absurd. It had only been through pure blind luck that the cults on Slorkenberg hadn't ravaged the planet as they fought to decide who would inherit it. As for the times when I didn't manage to convince myself, well, there was a reason I'd made a small but not insignificant dent into the cellar I'd inherited from the former governor since the uprising. Speaking of, I had a party to get back to. I opened the door to leave the dinner room, Militia and Jurgen on my heels, only to freeze. All the other members of the Liberation Council were there in the corridor, staring at me. Somehow, in the excitement of finally doing something which wouldn't damn my soul, I had completely forgotten they were there. They were all dressed to the nines. Mahalone was in full military uniform. Jafar wore ornate robes of blue and gold. Tessalon Kappa had changed their usual working red vestments for brand new ones, and Christabel wore a silver and purple dress that didn't so much walk the line between decency and indecency as twirl and dance back and forth around it. I prepared myself for another round of deceit and manipulation. 
I had told the rest of the Liberation Council about Vale in advance of having dinner, with her E had needed an excuse to not be present at the celebrations for that long, and keeping this secret from them would have backfired sooner or later. But I hadn't told them the details of the deal I'd made with Leraz. They might have argued against giving her the panacea tea, and though it was a lesson I'd been too cunning to ever need to use myself, I knew from my days at the Scola it was better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Still, for a moment, I felt panic rise, threatening to consume me whole. Throne, what if this was the moment they finally saw through my deceptions and realized I had done what I did simply to get some kudos with the god emperor? Even if that was going too far, what if they objected to my actions and were about to make their displeasure known in a violent manner? I thought I could rely on Jurgen to stay by my side, but Melissa was bound by Emeli, and if Christabel told her I had turned, Lord Liberator, Malone bellowed, and to my utter shock I realized that the general was crying. What a great speech that was. We should have known your vision, reached so much further than Slorkenberg. Indeed, said Jafar, who at least was calmer than the general, even if seeing him with a wide smile on his face was mildly disturbing, to turn an inquisitor into the instrument by which you declare war against the Lord of Decay, truly awe-inspiring. It was a rare treat to hear you so passionate, said Christabel, while taking hold of my arm and pressing herself against me, which did very interesting things to her figure. You are usually so calm and collected. It was a pleasant change of pace. I smiled, and thankfully she mistook my relief that they had all bought it as embarrassment for such a public display. Thank you all for your kind words. Margos, I asked Tessilon Kappa, making it seem as if I were trying to change the subject, did your people get anything useful from our guests' exit? The thought of the Cenas being capable of bypassing all our security and materialising inside my quarters at any time was a disturbing one, given I'd no idea what Lyra has his motivations were. So before the dinner room had been set, the Borgs had installed as many auspexes and scanners as could be hidden under the decorations. All of these devices had transmitted their findings to another room, but I had little doubt Tessalon Kappa had been monitoring the results remotely. Our instruments have detected some strange readings. They confirmed with an enthusiastic nod, buying my false display of modesty wholesale. Making sense of them will take some time, but we will crack that mystery eventually, eh? I see. Well, I have full confidence you will figure it out. I told them, lying through my teeth, a coy given the kind of things the Borgs had already achieved. Perhaps I was being unfair to them. Behind me, I heard Militia's quiet scoff at the notion that primitive Monkey could decipher the mysteries of her kind, but I let it pass. In the meantime, let us go back to the party, shall we? Oh, yes, purred Christabel. There is much I don't want you to miss, Syphers. All in all, I felt remarkably happy about how the day had gone given how close to death I had come. Of course, had I then known just how much trouble that rant I'd taken straight out of third-rate mummer's play would end up causing me, I would have jumped through the webway portal behind Lerahaz and taken my chances with the Inquisition. On the bridge of the Lucrophodis, the rogue trader Aurelius sighed as he took in the list of damage his vessel had suffered during the latest stretch of their tormented journey. Truthfully, it wasn't that bad. The ship had suffered much worse on much shorter trips. A couple of Uspix arrays had been knocked out of alignment. The lights on Deck 42 had gone dark, and half a dozen crewmen had lost their minds and started ranting about some vast and terrible shadowy hand reaching out to seize the ship. Given that they had been working on entirely separate sections of the kilometers long vessel, it was something to keep an eye on. Since they had lost Inquisitor Vale to that Zeno's ambush, things had kept going wrong. The rest of the Inquisitor's team had managed to make it off-world, but the loss of their leader had hit them pretty hard. They'd remained in their quarters as the ship made the return trip to more civilized space in order to report the Inquisitor's disappearance. Losing the Inquisitor would have been bad in any circumstances, but the fact she'd been taken by the Dark Elders was even worse. Orpheus hadn't faced the chaos-tainted Xenos himself, thank the throne, but he'd heard plenty from those who had and each story was more horrifying than the last. 
The journey itself had been exhausting all on its own. From the moment they'd entered the warp, they had been beset by what the navigator claimed weren't exactly storms, but instead opposing and shifting currents in the immaterium. In addition to rendering astropathic communication impossible, preventing them from sending word of the Inquisitor's capture ahead, it also made progress very difficult and forced them to drop out of the warp at regular intervals in order to check the engines, calculate their position, and establish a new heading. Between this and the usual time dilation of warp travel, the master of Orspex told him that nearly one standard year had passed in the materium according to his instruments, though it had been less than half that for most of the Lucre Fodis's crew, and they were still only halfway to their destination. They had enough supplies to last the trip. Of course, Aurelius was a rogue trader after all, and before coming under Inquisitor Vale's influence, he'd spent years away from friendly ports. Exploring the wild frontier in the name of Emperor, dynasty and prophet Haps, not always in that order, but nobody living had any proof otherwise and he would swear to the contrary until his dying breath. If things continued like this, they should still have a comfortable margin by the time they reached a port where they could resupply. But not knowing why this was happening at all was getting on his nerves, and that of the rest of his crew as well. He was about to vox the navigator to ask how long they would need before re-entering the warp when the air on the deck twisted. That was the only word he could think of to describe it, before a tear opened in reality through which Aurelius caught a brief glimpse of a vast tunnel before it spat out a humanoid figure and closed with a sighing sound of displaced air. Intruder on deck, he barked, hands moving to the weapons at his belt before freezing in place as the figure stood up and, to his absolute bewilderment, he recognized her. Instead of the combat uniform she'd worn when he'd last seen her, she was covered in something more appropriate for the halls of the Spire born, and she carried no weapons, only a strange device he didn't recognize but was clearly of human design. But it was still impossible for him to mistake the intruder's identity. Lady Vale? he asked, not believing the evidence of his senses. Aurelius, she sighed, sounding both relieved and deeply exhausted. Throne, I am glad to see you. You would not believe the day I have had. Right now, though, I need you to escort me to your most secure safe so I can store this inside it until we can get it analyzed by a reliable tech priest. Then I need your Medicaid to give me a full checkup. And then I want to debrief my team about what happened. I assume they are on board. Yes, Inquisitor. The rogue trader managed to say. He glanced back at his console terminal. The scans of the individual in front of him he had discreetly started were returning a fully positive identification. However impossible it might seem, this truly was Amberly Vale. But, well, sorry about this, but could you explain how you came here? We are in the middle of nowhere. The warp journey from where we lost you has been difficult. A strange expression flashed across Amberly's face. Difficult. Of course that makes sense. It did is. The navigator and astropaths had no idea why their passage through the warp had been both slow and relatively tranquil. To answer your question, I was brought here through the webway by an Eldar Harlequin who bought my life and freedom from the Chaos Warlord. I failed to assassinate after escaping from the Dark Elders during their raid of his palace, which took place after he'd killed an Orc Warboss which was with the process of becoming a sector-level threat in single combat. Aurelius's mouth moved for several seconds, but no sound came out. Eventually, he said, What here? As I said, you would not believe the day I have had to the uninitiated. Jafar's office looked like a complete mess. His desk was all but covered in piles of paper and data slates. The keys of his personal cogitator were worn down with use, and an empty pot of recaf was gathering dust from its precarious perch atop a pile of tax reports from the Southern Hemisphere. In truth, however, there was a secret pattern to the seemingly random disorder, one that the chief clerk had carefully arranged since the uprising, all in order to consecrate his office as a sacred space to the change of ways. He knew exactly where every piece of information was and could process paperwork with far greater efficiency than when he'd been constrained by the administratum's procedures and standards. This, the ability to find patterns within what seemed like randomness, was Jafar's gift as a servant of Tsienge, and one he'd used in everything from his office's organization to the new road networks, stretching across Slorkenberg to cope with the planet's growing industrial base. 
In his own opinion, the chief clerk was effectively the most influential member of the Liberation Council, except for the Liberator, of course. Yes, he might not command the legions of trained soldiers Malone did, wield the technological law Tessilon Kappa did, or enjoy the daemonic patronage of the Liberator's own consort like Christabel. But while his power base was less flashy than his cohorts, it was far more expansive. Running a planet took a lot of work, and while Jafar didn't doubt Kane could have managed it, the Liberator was too busy with greater concerns to worry about the minutiae of government. Since the uprising, Jafar had carefully expanded the ranks of the cults of Tsiench under his command, inducting key members of the many local councils and politics which made up Slorkenberg's social fabric. The approach to conversion Khan had suggested what felt like a lifetime ago had proven very effective. While the cults of Tsiench didn't count as many members they could have, those who had joined were far more dedicated and useful to the cause. Jafar had been able to almost completely delegate the work of spreading the teachings of the architect of fate to others, while focusing on his work in the council and his own inner circle of acolytes. Almost, however, wasn't the same thing as completely, which was why he was currently glaring at the pair of individuals before him, both of whom were looking sheepishly down and sweating profusely. All right, he said at last, once enough time had passed with him silently glaring at them. Let's go over this together again, because I could swear we had already gotten over this the last time I had to summon the two of you here. No, he raised his hand, cutting the two off before they could give voice to their protests. You will only speak when I ask you to speak, not before. They nodded jerkily, clearly afraid of the chief clerk's wrath. Good. Jafar didn't intend to kill either of them. Their transgressions didn't warrant it, and the Liberator didn't approve of lethally punishing underlings for their failures, as this was a waste of resources that Slorkenberg couldn't afford. But they didn't need to know that. Yesterday, he began, I received an urgent report from my circle of acolytes that, if nothing was done, there would be a violent empiric disturbance in the capital before the end of the week, which had the potential to escalate into a full-scale daemonic incursion. While I doubt things would have actually gotten this bad, the fact that they pointed the two of you as responsible was very distressing. I was forced to turn aside from my very important work to perform a scrying ritual myself in order to figure out what was going on. One of the many advantages of the Liberator's wise edict prohibiting human sacrifices and daemon summoning was that it had forced Jafar and his acolytes to explore less obvious avenues to grow their sorcerous knowledge. The followers of the Changer of Ways had focused their efforts on divination rituals and other utilities thaumaturgical workings which, while less destructive, were also far less dangerous and more useful in day-to-day -day life. Of course, such divination spells had their limits. None of Slorkenberg's Maggie could peer beyond the limits of the system, and even within it Kane's own fate was completely obscured. When Jafar had led one such attempt purely to see if there was any danger lurking in the Liberator's future, of course, they'd failed to pierce through the shadows covering his destiny, yet another clear sign of the architect's favour for Slorkenberg's champion. But the two sitting in front of him weren't even close to the Liberator's level, and Jafar's rituals had revealed the truth. I go, Jafar said, and the older man sat to his right twitched. You were preparing to cast an entropic curse on Nikolash, and you, Nikolash. You were going to summon a daemon and bind it to Kiliago. Either of those would have been dangerous enough, but according to my calculations, the interaction between the two workings would result in precisely the calamity my acolytes foresaw. Argo and Nikolash were both leaders of their own branches of the Sentian Alliance Jafar, led, having brought them all together with the Liberator's invaluable assistance, in the days leading to the uprising, both of them were astromancers. They sought the truth in the pattern of the stars, for though the Empyrean was a reflection of all mortal souls, its interactions with the Materium could be influenced by the motion of celestial bodies. Before the uprising, Nicholas had worked in the capital's planetarium, forced to repeat the same basic spiel over and over again to uninterested tourists until he'd snapped and embraced Sienge so he'd be able to interact with people who actually shared his interests and were his intellectual equals. Ego was newer to the scene, having risen from the bottom through the ranks of a cult of street rats who longed for the distant stars as a means of escaping their terrible lives. 
Catching on his intelligence, Jafar had personally ensured Iego's education, into which he'd thrown himself wholeheartedly. When the fist of the Liberator had destroyed the Drukhari flagship, the hole in reality its experimental weapon had created had left both stargazing cults confused as to how to incorporate it into their respective models of the universe. The exact details of their interpretations were too complex to get into without several years of studies and a few days to get through the explanations, but at the core of the dispute laid the fact that Iago's group had wanted to call it the localized material atheric overlaps, while Nikolas had named it the empyreal stellar phenomenon. Within days of the Sinos invasion's defeat, the argument between the cults had escalated to the points where members had been punching each other in the halls of the Liberation Palace, and both sides were starting to bring knives to work. Jafar had been forced to intervene to settle the issue before things came to bloodshed. The anomaly had been called the Liberator's Fire, and study into its nature was a subject shared by the Sientian star cults and the bringers of renewed greatness. The chief clerk had, though that was the matter handled, clearly he'd been mistaken, and Jafar didn't enjoy being mistaken. Yet, however much he wanted to tear Iego and Nicholas apart, he had to stay calm. The Liberator never showed any of his burning, ceaseless rage at the Imperium's uncounted crimes against humanity slipped from his control. For mastery of the self was the first step to mastering the rest of the universe. In this, as in many other things, Jafar was determined to follow in the glorious leader's footsteps, even without taking into account the blatant violation of the Liberator's prescription on daemonic summoning from you, Nikolash. And trust me, we will discuss it later. Such behavior is a disgrace to the Liberation's ideals, he told the two cult leaders coldly. We of Slorkenberg stand alone, surrounded by enemies. We cannot afford to fight each other. Having disagreements is fine, healthy even, for to follow one path blindly and without question leads to the same stagnation and dogmatism that have calcified the Imperium. But for things to escalate, violence is intolerable. Do you understand? Iago and Nikolas nodded meekly. That the two of you felt you had to escalate things to this degree is, in part, a failure on my own part as your leader, Jafar admitted, making the two of them glance up at him in surprise. I really thought you were both smarter and wiser than this. The Liberator trusts us, the followers of the Changing God, to perform the vital role of keeping the gears of society turning and making sure the whole machinery gets better and better over time. To paraphrase a saying from the Borgs, cannot do that if the cogs are trying to kill each other, be it with knives or thaumaturgy. Admittedly, Iago and Nikolash didn't exactly have crucial parts to play outside of their respective cults. They were part of Slorkenberg's growing academic culture, now that education was freely available to those who sought to expand their minds instead of being treated as a path to heresy and rebellion like it was in the Imperium. But Cain himself had insisted on the importance of such things, going so far as to ensure substantial resources were invested into various academic domains. It hadn't taken long for Jafar to realize that the Liberator was playing the long game here. While new universities and public libraries might not provide the immediate gains of, say, raising a new regiment of USA troops, an educated population was one where every one of their limited number of citizens was much more capable. While this was far from Kane's shrewdest gambit, it was still one that went straight against imperial attitudes toward education, and yet more evidence of how completely the Imperium had failed in bending the Liberator to its self-defeating dogma. There'll be no more attempts at killing each other from the two of you, Jafar declared, and this foolish feud between your factions is at an end too. No, I don't care who you think started it in the first place. By now, it doesn't matter. You almost destroyed this world with your stupidity, or worse, led us to a situation where we'd have to beg the handmaidens to disturb the Lady Emily for assistance. Do either of you want her to think we're incapable of doing our jobs? While most people on Slorkenberg regarded the Liberator's Paramour as having transcended the limitations of flesh upon her martyrdom thanks to her devotion to Cain, all three Magi present in the room knew this was only partially true. And while Emily's love for the Liberator was undeniable at least not until you were not just suicidal, but terminally stupid. Jaffer had known her when she was still mortal and doubted Daemonhood had diminished her viciousness. 
The two shivered in terror at the thought of the handmaiden's mistress' displeasure. Good. This lecture was going to last much, much longer before Jafar was satisfied. For some reason, when he dedicated himself to the changer of ways, he hadn't thought so much of his job would be like herding felids or running a kindergarten. Sitting in her quarters aboard the Lucrophodis, Amberley contemplated the events of the last months. Since his escapes from Slorkenberg and return to Imperial space, the Inquisitor had been busier than ever. One of the first things she'd done had been to replace the implants she'd lost on Slorkenberg with new, identical ones, and the scars from the surgery had faded away completely, and thanked to Kane's not-so-little gift, it had all happened in record time. The Panacea DST was still stored in Aurelius' most secure vault. When the rogue trader had realised just what the Inquisitor had brought back, he had almost passed out in shock before immediately ordering his tech priests to check it for any sign of tempering or foul play. They hadn't found anything, though Aurelius had needed to threaten them of shooting them in order to keep them from spreading the word of such a holy relic's discovery, the first time the ship docked somewhere with other members of the machine cult. From the moment Khan had let her take the STC, she had known she needed to be very, very careful about how she handled this. One wrong move and the entire Segmentum could end up tearing itself apart in a bloody struggle for ownership of the SDC. That wasn't even the worst-case scenario, but she refused to think too hard on that lest she be completely paralysed by fear. Part of her had been tempted to simply chuck it into the nearest sun once its contents were safely duplicated onto the Lucrophodis's cogitators, but she'd abandoned that course of action. Regardless of the danger it posed to the stability of the Imperium, the CSC was still an incredible relic from mankind's golden age. More pragmatically, the Mechanicus would absolutely try to kill her if she did that. Prior to her abduction by the Drukhari, she'd always been one of the more wandering type of inquisitors, making a lot of contacts as she pursued various Sinos threats within and without the Imperium, but not building up a proper power base to speak of. She'd been fine with it, but if she wanted to make use of Kane's gift in a way that truly benefited the Imperium, that had to change. In the end, she'd decided to bring Lord General Zavan in on the whole affair. The Graf officer had risen to command of the Sector's Militarum. More or less without issue, once the hidden conclave she'd stumbled upon had thrown its support behind him, and from what she'd heard, he was doing an admirable job of cleaning up the unholy mess he'd inherited because of Karamazov's stupidity. Zyvan's nervousness at being asked for a meeting by an Inquisitor Emberley had been polite about it, but it had always been clear to both of them. It was an order, not a request, had faded away quickly once she'd explained what she needed from him, replaced by doubt, then awed wonder. The Lord General had immediately grasped what an advantage the panacea could represent for the troops under his command once it was widely distributed. The fact that it only worked on humans meant that the risk of it falling into enemy hands, which was one of the main reasons beyond Mechanicus dogma such knowledge was restricted, was negligible. With Zyvan's support, Amberley's efforts had really started to take off. The Lord General had plenty of contacts whom he believed could be trusted with matters of such import, and Amberley had spent the time since then journeying across the sector to meet them, assess their character in person, and hand them copies of the Panacea Steam. She had also done the same with her own loose network of acquaintances, and even asked Aurelius whether he knew other bearers of a warrant of trade who could be reasonably relied upon. She had done her best to impress upon them all the importance of discretion in this matter, but she wasn't a fool. Word had probably already gotten out somehow, but she hoped that, by the time the wider Imperium learned of her discovery, there would be enough facilities producing the panacea that any attempt to restrict its use would be pointless. Amberley knew that, while navigating the politics of the Imperium and the Mechanicus was going to be dangerous, it wasn't the only threat she'd face. The followers of Nurgle, at the very least, would stop at nothing to stop her. The panacea was so useful that surely it must have been spread far and wide during the Dark Age of Technology, yet only two copies had been recovered by mankind so far. To her, this reeked of deliberate action, and she could think of no better suspect than the Plague God, working ever since the Age of Strife to destroy every copy of it in existence. If she was right, then it gave Kane's seemingly suicidal declaration of war against a dark power suddenly seem a lot more 
well, not reasonable, but perhaps understandable, Aurelius's navigator had reported several attempts by daemonic swarms to breach through the ship's Geller field since her return, but some unidentified other power had kept them at bay. The crew believed it to be the hand of the god emperor protecting them as they carried out his will, but Amberly wasn't so sure. She was ready to accept that the master of mankind might take a direct interest in something as momentous as the Panacea Sea being returned to humanity, but it was all too possible they were being protected by the other dark gods for their own reasons. Beyond weakening one of their rivals, the potential for things to go horribly wrong in ways that ultimately benefited chaos was also there. Soldiers no longer dying from their injuries could return to the fight and die in battle instead. People who knew anything short of death could be cured might indulge in pleasures that would otherwise cause long-term harm. And of course, there was no need to explain how the introduction of the panacea could cause schemes, intrigue and betrayal. It was a brilliant gambit by Cain. No matter what she did, no matter what happened, giving her the panacea would benefit him, even if it also ended up benefiting the Imperium, against her own judgment. Amberly couldn't help herself but be awed at the genius of it all. She couldn't have conceived of such a scheme herself, despite all her training and experience as an inquisitor. The fact that Cain had done it while only being a few years out of the Scola was a clear sign of his genius, and she was terrified of what he might achieve if given time to grow even further. Yet even still, she would carry on. She still remembered the shrines of the god emperor she had seen on Slorkenberg. Small, yes, especially compared to the monuments the Liberation Council had erected in the place of the destroyed cathedrals, but there had been no denying the honesty of the faith of those attending them. She wanted to believe that this was all part of his plan, though she couldn't help but wonder whether Cain himself realized the possibility that maybe, just maybe, he was indirectly doing the work of the God Emperor and not that of his infernal masters. No, surely that was impossible. No matter how reasonable and charismatic a mask he'd projected during their meetings, no matter how sincere he might have been his impassioned speech about the failings of the Imperium, Amberley had seen him call upon a daemon princess of Slainish merely by uttering her name and had heard all sorts of rumours about his relationship with the cult of the handmaidens who served her. Such matters might not be her speciality. She was going to have to change that if she were to hope to ever be Cain's match. But she knew enough to know the Liberator's soul was irredeemably damned. Which was a shame. She still had no idea how exactly Cypher's Cain had been set upon his dark path, but clearly he would have been a great asset to the Imperium had he stayed true to the throne. Inquisitor Kaliad Shen frowned as she looked at the latest reports from her agents. The casualties her forces had taken in eliminating the mercenaries sent by someone she was almost certain was a relative of the neighbouring Lord Sector, if not a cat's paw for the Lord Sector himself, to acquire the original Panacea ST had been slightly higher than she'd expected. At least the bribes to convince the administrators of the Void Station where the engagement had taken place to stay silent about it had remained within her expectations. Young Vale really was causing quite the stir, Kaliad reflected. That mercenary troop was only the first such attempt. By the end of the year, Kaliad fully expected entire wars to be declared in order to seize the ST. Whether Vale would be ready for them or not was still up in the air, but in the end, Kaliad thought it didn't matter. As an Isvanian, though, that she made her adherence to the creed known, for the blind and foolish would have made her activities much more difficult. Kaliad knew that such strife would make the Imperium stronger one way or another. Either Vale's growing faction endured and managed to grow into something that would shake the very foundations of the Imperium, or they would fail, and the secrets of the Panacea would pass into the hands of those who'd managed to defeat them. Regardless, the Imperium would gain the benefits of the ST and deny Cain the opportunity to use access to its miracles to sway other worlds to his cause. Vale had truly done the Imperium a great service when she'd managed to steal the Panacea with the help of her Harlequin contacts. As a member of the Ordo Hereticus, Kaliad had little experience with the elusive Senos, but she knew forging such an alliance couldn't have been easy. And now, the young Inquisitor was spreading her influence, forging a coalition of like-minded souls with impressive alacrity. Then again, Kaliad reflected. 
she should have expected nothing else from the one chosen to act as his representative. It had been many years since the Rosea Panthera had last been sighted, and Caliad had half thought the ship's master to have perished until the young Inquisitor had shown up at their regular meeting and taken the seat the rest of them had left empty more out of habit than any real expectation of needing it. Now that he might be back in the game at long last. However, indirectly, Caliad would much rather stay on his good side, which was why she was providing Vale some hidden support, giving her faction time to grow properly before it faced the backlash from the rest of the Imperium. She had seen what happened to those who earned his displeasure and had no desire to join them. Strife might make the Imperium as a whole stronger. But dead was still dead, and she had far too much left to do to die. Macragish, the jewel of the Ultima Segmentum, had fallen, the walls of its fortresses broken, its pristine cities were aflame, its people screaming as hordes of grinning heretics offered them up as sacrifices to corn, Ziench and Slyanesh. Unholy monuments were being erected, and dark rites performed to call upon the favour of the gods whose laughter echoed in the souls of all present. Mechanised horrors stalked the ruins for imperial survivors, dragging them out of their hiding places and adding them to the sacrificial pyres. The broken corpses of ultramarines were scattered on the ground where the chapter had made its last stand, surrounded by a veritable sea of mortal bodies. Their mingled blood spread in a pool in which the faces of the damned were reflected, distorted in silent, endless agony. Above, the skies were blazing with warp fire, and swarms of cackling never born dense enough to blot out the sun flu, occasionally leaving the atmosphere to gnaw on the carcasses of what had once been the proud fleet of a first founding chapter. On a throne, made of the defiled bones of Primarch Gulliman and his sons, the one responsible for all this devastation sat clad in an immense suit of crimson armour, the transhuman blood that covered it almost completely masking the fell sigils emblazoned upon the metal which proclaimed its wearer's allegiance to chaos. The armor's helmet was off, revealing a face hideously warped by the boons of the dark gods, yet unmistakable all the same. A pair of wicked horns grew from its forehead, casting a shadow on its face that was pierced by the hellish glow of its eyes, two where they should be, and a third on the forehead, right between the horns. The air around it shimmered, showing brief glimpses of a figure that was equally beautiful and terrible holding it in a lascivious embrace, while hundreds of lesser heretics prostrated themselves before the throne of Bones's occupant, voices raised in praise and supplication. The Chaos Warlord smiled at me, and I quivered at the sight of its pointed teeth, each carved with a Chaos rune, before it bit into the heart of Marnius Calga, tearing out a chunk of meat before swallowing, the blood of the legendary chapter master pouring down its chin. I am inevitable, said the liberator with my voice. I awoke, shaking and covered in sweat. With trembling fingers, I reached for the bottle of Amasic on my nightstand. Without wasting time pouring myself a glass, I uncorked it and drank straight from the bottle, letting the burning sensation in my throat distract me from the nightmare. And it had only been a nightmare, I told myself, a wild conjuration of my overstressed mind. Nothing more. I had never been on McCraig, had only heard stories about it at the Scholar. Chances were, the real place was completely different from what my brain had made up. Not that I was ever going to have the opportunity to check. Just a nightmare. I repeated to myself, putting the now empty bottle down and hugging myself, alone in my bed, surrounded by the luxurious fineries of a man I'd killed to save my own hide. Just a nightmare. It wasn't the first time I had that nightmare or another like it, and unfortunately, it probably wouldn't be the last. Sometimes it was McCrag. Sometimes it was Bale, the home of the Blood Angels. Sometimes it was Valhalla. And once, in a particularly horrible one, it had even been Holy Terror itself. But always, always the dream would end the same way, with that awful thing looking at me through the dream and speaking those same words. Threat. Promise of prophecy. I did not know and was terrified to find out. I wanted to kneel, to pray to the God Emperor for forgiveness, but I knew that it would not come, that I didn't deserve it and perhaps never would. Just a nightmare.